Well, hello and welcome YouTube, Mr. Robinson back here with yet another brand new exciting video, all math based of course, and as always it is an honor and a privilege to be serving you today as it is every day here in my virtual classroom. Step on inside as we jump into section 2.6 in the Big Ideas Math Integrated Math 3 textbook on characteristics of quadratic functions. Now we just came off section 2.5 on transforming quadratic functions where we talked a lot more about vertex form and we got to do tableless graphing. Oh, happy day. We get to continue some more of that, guys, more tableless graphing. But now talking about those characteristics, the min and max value, the axis of symmetry, looking at all the different forms, not just vertex form, but also standard form and factored form, also known as intercept form. These are things we learned in IM2. And I don't know if it's just because they're all now covered in one section instead of like five or six of them in IM2 that makes it more enriching and exciting and challenging and all that and all I am three based and plus the fact that now this time they're expecting you to not use the table I think um, and still use the transformations as before but you know I've I don't know if I mentioned it to you guys I mentioned it to my students whenever they ask um, I think the jump from I am one to I am two is bigger than the jump from I am two to I am three and this is kind of indicative of that because we're going back to things you did in I am two and if you followed me with the video stuff at the time this stuff should totally ring a bell I mean in the way that if you remember it um, if you do, you're like, all right, awesome. This is stuff that I can do. So this stuff would be akin to what we were doing in chapter three in IM2. I think it was from sections three, one, all the way to like three, five, or maybe even three, six. So if you look at all those and you look at this stuff here, they should kind of be the same. I don't know how the questions will go, but based on what I'm seeing for what we're going to do, yeah, it's kind of the same. So guys, if you want to follow along, jump down to the description section down below and you can download this PDF. You can download the graph paper as well if you'd like to print it out. However it is that you go about your graphing needs and also follow the timestamps for what you're going to be looking at here. Now, this is a big problem set. Okay, it's a big problem set. We're going to be doing up to 84 problems. This can be a very long video. I'm anticipating three hours plus easily. So strap in. Let's go. Okay, <laughs> no knuckles actually cracked. I should put in a little sound effect there, but I'm not going to. Okay, we're going to learn to explore properties of parabolas. That includes axis of symmetry, min and max value, things like that. We're going to find min, oh, min and max values of quadratic functions. I'd say that's a property of a parabola, personally. We're going to graph quadratic functions using x-intercepts. That's using intercept form right there. I also call it factored form. And we're going to rewrite equations. I assume we're going to transform different forms, go from standard form to... Um, intercept form, go from intercept form to standard form, standard form to vertex form, all, all of them you can do. I, I like standard form as being kind of the middle guy of intercept form and vertex form. Okay, let's explore properties of parabolas. Let's look at all of them, starting with the axis of symmetry. Now, I hinted at this in section 2.5, but the axis of symmetry is a line that divides a parabola into mirror images and passes through the vertex. So it's always at an x equals constant equation. The constant's going to be the... Uh, same one as the number that represents the x value of your vertex because it's a vertical line that goes through your vertex it shows how the parabola is truly symmetrical and i did not bury that lead when i did my own graphs with that every time i'd go one one here i'd also go one one there i would just reflect my points across because of that symmetry so that's not new drawing the line stating the equation of the line okay that's new for this section um, axis of symmetry is at the vertical line x equals h, h being the, like I said, x value, the vertex, you see it in vertex form there. Previously, you used transformations to graph quadratic functions in vertex form. You can also use the axis of symmetry and the vertex to graph quadratic functions written in vertex form. So, using symmetry to graph quadratic functions, again, this is something I was, I'm, I jumped the gun, admittedly, I jumped the gun. So, this is stuff, I'm probably going to gloss over this, it's going to go kind of fast because I've been doing this from before. Um, if you graph this, label the vertex and axis of symmetry, we identify A as negative 2. That means there's a reflection and a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. The H is actually negative 3, flipping that sign, and K is positive 4, keeping that sign. So you draw your vertex at negative 3, 4, and then you apply your stretch factor. Now this is the, instead of 1, 1, 2, 4, we're going to double it, and we are going down because it's negative, but 1, 2, 2, 8. And then you see them reflecting those points across. So I was just bringing that up, right? If I plot this point, I can go one away, one away, boom. Plot this point, two away, two away, boom. So nothing unlike what I've done previously. I do like that they're teaching it in a tableless fashion. It goes with what I've been preaching for since I am two. So that's good. Um, that, there's not much more I need to say on that part itself. But let's keep moving forward and see what else they're talking about down here. Quadratic functions can also be written in standard form, ax squared plus bx plus c. What you can do, this is a transformation, 
from one to another, you can take your vertex form quadratic equation and you can simplify it. By simplify, it means expand, distribute, combine like terms, get rid of all parentheses, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you expand this quadratic into a perfect square trinomial, you distribute the A into these terms, and then you add the K combining like terms, and you get these three terms here. Now it's important how they state the order in which you do this because order of operations apply and all that. You can't distribute A until you square this, and you can't add K until you distribute A. So all those things are crucial in order on how we do that, and I'm probably gonna write just as few steps as they did even in terms of expanding this binomial. You should know this one from IM2, and if not, hopefully enough times of me doing it is a good pattern for you to practice it. Otherwise, FOIL, um, expand that way. Now, the following observations are to be had. This is what they're kind of bringing up, and it's interesting the way that they write them to begin with and what it turns into. But the A value is still A. Whatever was the stretch factor before is still the stretch factor now. In standard form or in vertex, that's not actually vertex form. In standard form or in vertex form right here, that still represents that number. It should be the exact same. If it was a negative two before, it'll be a negative two now. Uh, the H and K are no longer visible here. This B is negative two times A times H, whatever. And the C is A H squared plus K, whatever. The point is these represent different values. Now C very specifically, I'm gonna bring that up first. C is the Y intercept. C is the Y intercept of your guy right here. And C is the uh, where you'll see your graph past your Y axis. It's the constant. Now B is a little tricky. B itself as a number is not specifically visible on our graphs. It does represent something. And using B with A, negative B over 2A gets you the X value of your vertex, otherwise known as H. So negative B over 2A is a prominent thing we're going to be doing with standard form equations as well. Now you got to plug in that number into your equation to get the Y value of your vertex. Vertex form is the only one that reveals the vertex. Standard form reveals your Y intercept and you can use stuff to get your vertex. Um, factored form, intercept form, we'll talk about that later. And those are what those bits of information mean there. Okay, I thought they were gonna take the previous example and transform it, it looks like not. Did they do that? Did I miss it? They did not do it, okay. So anyway, I'm not gonna do it on that problem unless they do it later. Now properties of the graph in standard form. You have, again, if A is greater than zero, it's gonna face upward. Zero C, like I said, is the y-intercept of this graph. It's the constant. When X is zero, you get C out. And then negative B over two A. I, I, this, this really does feel like an echo of what we said in IM2. Negative B over two A, you gotta plug that stuff in to get the X value of the vertex for not just the vertex, it's also the axis of symmetry, right? It's at X equals, boom, that. And like I said, you gotta plug in that value into your equation, F of, x, f of negative b over 2a to get the y value to vertex. So there's restating all that information again. Oh, if a is negative, it's going to open downward. Same thing. It's still a stretch factor, still a reflection factor. Okay, so let's look at a graph in standard form. Here's a standard form equation, 3x squared minus 6x plus 1. Now, they're going to start by finding the vertex, just like I probably would with you guys as well. They do say label the vertex and axis of symmetry. I don't know how much I pointed at that in the last example. But the vertex x value is at negative b over 2a. Now b is negative 6. So the opposite of negative 6 is 6 over 2 times 3, 6. 6 over 6 is 1. So the axis of symmetry is at the line x equals 1. The vertex is also somewhere on this line. What's the y value? How did they get the specific point? They substituted 1 for x in their equation. Right? That's how you find any point on a graph, like when you use a table, you plug in an x value. This one specifically will be 3 times 1 squared, which is 3, minus 6 times 1, 6. 3 minus 6 is negative 3, plus 1 is negative 2. So your vertex is at 1, negative 2. We plot the point, we graph the line, the axis of symmetry, and then you can apply the stretch factor to get the rest of the points. Now, they do also have this 1, which is the y-intercept. You can plot that point as well, which is right here. I think they're mentioning it right here, identify the y-intercept. That means opposite this thing on this other side is a corresponding point when you reflect across, that's one you can easily get, but that does agree with our uh, stretch factor of three. Over one up three seems to be the case. Now when we go over two, we would be going up not four, but 12, we triple uh, four. And that would be another set of points that we can find as well. They said evaluate with another point. They stopped short of their tableless graphing, it looks like. Just by plugging in a single value, I get it. I'm still gonna avoid even doing that. When I say use of table, I mean don't plug in anything except the vertex value because we don't have vertex form here. We need to plug in the x value of the vertex and find out what that is. 
Um, okay, let's keep moving forward there and let's find a maximum and minimum values. Because the vertex is the highest, highest or lowest point on a parabola, its y coordinate is the maximum value or the minimum value of the function. The max or min is all about what the y value is, how high it goes, how low it goes. The what is the y. If they ever say the when, especially on word problems, that's the x. When does the maximum value occur? What is the maximum value? Or when does the min occur? What is the min? The vertex lies on the axis of symmetry, so the function is increasing on one side of the axis and decreasing on the other side. So when you see that when you're at a minimum here, the function's decreasing all the way until it hits the minimum on the left side of the vertex. To the right side of the vertex, it's going up the rest of the way, therefore it's increasing. And when it's a maximum here, we increase from the left side and decrease down the right side. This is based on A being positive or negative. When A is positive, you have a minimum because it's upwards facing. When A is negative, it's a maximum because it's downwards facing. So the minimum value or the maximum value, like I said, is the Y value. This is more information we can talk about here. Domain being all real numbers goes forever left and right. Range is limited based on min or max. It's greater than or equal to the min or less than or equal to the max. It decreases to the left of x at negative b over 2a, increase to the right. We already talked about that stuff. So I'm sure we're going to have to answer those questions. They're probably going to do it in an example right now. These are, this section is characteristics of quadratic functions. So we're talking about all of those things. Maxes and min, axes of symmetry, intervals of increasing and decreasing values, all that. Uh, domain and range. All right, find the min or max value of y equals x, 1 half x squared minus 2x minus 1. Describe the domain and range and where the function is increasing and decreasing. Now, they never asked a graph. There is a graph off a graphing calculator. That's just to check and confirm that it's right. But if they don't ask me to graph, I'm just letting you know I'm probably not going to graph as well unless I show you a little double check. So we're going to find the min or max value. Because A is a positive number, we know this is going to be an upward facing graph. An upward facing graph means you have a minimum value. The minimum value is at the y value of the vertex. We got to find that by using negative b over 2a to get the x value and plug that in to get the y value. Let's see if they do the same thing. So they use negative b over 2a, finding the x value of the vertex, opposite of negative 2 over 2 times 1 half apparently is 2. You substitute 2 back into your equation, you get negative 3 for y. The minimum value of the, although the vertex is at 2, negative 3, the minimum is at negative 3. The minimum value is negative 3. Domains all real numbers goes forever left to right. Range is greater than y is greater than or equal to negative three. Function is decreasing to the left of x equals two and increasing to the right of x equals two. Um, it's interesting how they say that. I'm used to probably doing a little bit more of this increasing when x is greater than two and decreasing when x is less than two. Don't be surprised if I start writing something like that. There are some even books that or questions that'll ask use interval notation. They'll say, you know, show it from 2 to infinity here and from negative infinity to 2 like that. There are different things that they might ask of you and all of these mean the same thing. So I just want to make sure you're very aware in that sense. Okay, and there's a double check of all that where the graph is using a graphing calculator, what it actually looks like and we're all good. So they didn't ask us to graph. I'll keep moving forward. All right, let's graph quadratic functions using x-intercepts. Now this is what's called intercept form. I also refer to it as factored form because that's where you're actually doing factoring of your quadratic. This is assuming it's factorable or they give it to you in that form, of course. Now A still represents the same A as before. I don't see them mentioning that right now. They're saying A can't equal zero, but A is the same stretch factor as it's ever been. So if you have to do some factoring, A would be considered your GCF, your greatest common factor value. You can pull out of there before anything else. If you can't, then A is one. That's okay. Um, now, this stuff here is what reveals, like it's they said, your x-intercepts. If you remember something about factoring anything, having something in factored form, if you set it equal to zero, in this case for us, when y equals zero, when y equals zero, those are where you cross the x-axis. Those are x-intercepts. So if your equation equals zero in that scenario, you can use zero product property to solve a factored form very easily. If x minus p times x minus q equals zero, either p equals zero or q equals zero. These are the x-intercepts, excuse me, I said that totally wrong. If x minus, either x minus p equals zero or x minus q equals zero, and then x either equals p or x equals q as your x-intercepts, okay? p and q are your x-intercepts. Now your axis of symmetry is exactly, as they say, it's exactly halfway between your two x-intercepts because these are two points of the same height Therefore, they're both going to be equidistant from the axis of symmetry. 
So the axis of symmetry is exactly halfway in between there. So how can you find the axis of symmetry? You can either count half the distance if you're graphing it, or you can average your values. A midpoint of two numbers is averaging those numbers. That's why you're seeing a little formula here where you add them up and divide by two. I ask something very easily. What's halfway between the numbers one and five? Halfway between one and five is three. You can either count half the distance between, or you can average one and five. One plus five divided by two is six over two, which is three. Anyway, that's your x value for your axis of symmetry. Then you can find the y value of the vertex by plugging three into your equation. Now this equation might be an intercept form instead of standard form, no biggie. You can still end up finding it that way. So let's look at an example of this. The graph will already be revealed as the final because we can't progress along the single piece of paper. It's not a slideshow. But here's a function already written in intercept form. They say label the x-intercepts, vertex, and axis of symmetry. They do say graph it. Um, so as far as this goes, your intercepts will be negative 3 and 1. Notice they'll be opposite of these values because technically what you're doing is setting this equation equal to 0 using zero product property and solving these two equations. This is where x equals negative 3 x equals 1. The values of x and y equals 0 are your x-intercepts. That's the first thing you'll end up plotting for the most part on this. Now from there we can find the axis of symmetry. Axis of symmetry is exactly halfway between the numbers three, uh, negative 3 and 1. If you look at it on the graph you can see these are four apart from each other. Half that distance is 2 and 2 away from negative 3 or from 1 is the value negative 1. So x equals negative 1 is your axis of symmetry. What they did mathematically was they averaged negative 3 and 1, and they also got the x value of negative 1. That's the axis of symmetry, and then the vertex is where you plug in negative 1 into your equation. This f of x equation, negative 1 and negative 1 go into here. It calculates to become 8, so negative 1 comma 8 is your vertex. That's another point you can plot. You can, um, they said draw a parabola through that stuff. Obviously, I'm going to be doing more in the form of stretch factor. Because it's negative 2, it makes sense that it's upside down. And it's stretched. We go 1, 2 and reflect it. 2, 8 is confirmed to be those points right there. And you reflect and we're all good to go. Now, there's no, this is the y-intercept 0, 6. But because this isn't written in standard form, we can't officially confirm that. Unless you, uh, well, we can see it right here in their table, 0, 6 is indeed the y-intercept. That confirms it. But if you expand it in standard form, your constant would show that as well. They're showing all the confirmations of everything else, which is fantastic. OK. Rewriting equations. You can use completing, oh, completing the square to rewrite equations of the form ax squared plus by squared plus cx plus dy plus e equals 0. If you remember, this is the general form of the equation of a circle. If x squared and y squared are both visible. If only one is visible, then it's a parabola. This would be uh, an upwards or downwards facing parabola. This would be a leftwards or rightwards facing parabola. But you can use completing the square to get it in a certain form, whether you want to get standard form of a circle or maybe vertex form of a quadratic. So let's see what they're doing with these. I didn't know that this was going to be a part of it. I thought by rewriting forms, they meant turn vertex form into standard, turn standard into factored, things like that. Maybe they won't do that here. Use completing the square to find the vertex of the parabola or the center and radius of the circle, then graph the equation. Now you have to recognize what kind of equation it's going to be based on the information. This one has an x squared, check. It doesn't have a y squared. Therefore, and there's a y here. Therefore, this is a parabola equation, not a circle. I'm already going to look at part b and tell you about this. This has an x squared and a y squared. This is going to be indicative of the equation of a circle. So this one is parabola whereas this one is circle. And it changes pretty much how we go about writing our equations, right? In circle, if you remember, that appearance of that form is x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k quantity squared equals r squared. Basically complete both squares and get them on the same side of the equation. This one here, assuming you're getting y by itself, you're going to get the y and x on opposite sides of the equations here. We kind of use different sets of letters, a instead of r, stuff like that. But we're going to get them in different forms, but they still involve completing the square. They do want you to graph the equations as well. So that means we're going to have to graph some circles. Not actually the same kind of quadratic I expected. OK, they're saying on that part A, it has no y squared term. So we're going to isolate the x's and complete the square. I might write it a little bit differently, but I'm going to do the same idea as they're going to right here. Definitely get these guys by themselves. Or at least, you know, make sure that that 7 is not going to be a part of what I do for factoring. Factor the negative 2 out because you need a 1x squared right here. Factor that out, and then you complete the square inside. Now, what you'll notice here is that we added a 4 here, and normally whatever you do to one side of the equation, you should do on the other. So y is this minus 8. 
because it's actually negative 2 times 4. Negative 2 is factored on the outside. It doesn't mean that the true value of this is until negative 2 times 4, though. So that negative 8 is from negative 2 times 4, which is what you're adding to both sides, not just putting a plus 4 there. And then this factors down to x minus 2 quantity squared. They decide this negative 15 to add it back over to this other side so they can get the true vertex form appearance. y equals negative 2 times x minus 2 quantity squared plus 15. That gets you a vertex of 215, as they write. There it is. Because the two, because it's a negative stretch factor, it's going to be downward facing. Okay. Um, they, I don't know what else they do from that. I guess they just plot some more points. Do they, let's see, they don't show anything else on that. But yeah, they end up plotting some more points there. So I would just use the stretch factor of two and go over one down two, over two down eight, over three down 18, things like that. Okay. Let's look at part B. The equation has an x squared term and a y squared term, so it's going to be a circle. We're going to complete the square on these two separate parts. Let's join up the x terms together right here. Let's join up the y terms together right here. And individually, we're going to uh, excuse me, complete separate squares. The 6 was not on this side of the equation before, right? Yeah, they added the 6 over to this other side, and that's actually recommended because that'll be part of your r squared. Now, whatever you do in completing the square right here, you're also going to do on the other side. So plus 1 here, plus 1 and plus nine and plus nine. I'm not teaching too much on how to complete the square. We already did a little bit of it in the first chapter, I think. And you've done it in IM2. But you divide this number by two and square it. You divide this number by two and square it. So this factors down to x minus one quantity squared. This factors down to y plus three quantity squared. Six plus one plus nine is 16. This is standard form of a circle equation. They also have it written here. So your center is gonna be at one, negative three. Boom, we plot it as the center. Your radius is four, square root of 16, boom. So for four, I can count up four, plot that point, down four, right four, and left four, and draw your best circle that you can do as a result of that. That'll be our circle graph. So quite a bit that we're doing in this section. No wonder it's going to be 84 problems, so from 22 minutes into the lecture, and that is the end of the lecture. A lot of my lectures seem to have been 22 minutes pretty much on the dot, or at that minute. Okay, let's start with numbers one and two on the vocabulary and core concept check. Number one, writing, explain how to determine whether a quadratic function will have a min or max value. It's all based off your stretch factor, guys. If A is greater than zero, and I want you to think about this, don't memorize it. If A is greater than zero, it's a positive number. Positive number means smiley face, upward facing parabola. That means it's hitting a bottom. That bottom is a minimum. Your parabola is a minimum. Uh, I'll just say minimum. If a is greater than, if less than zero, now it's downward facing. Downward facing means it hits a top point. That top point is a maximum. So that's all I'm going to say. So it's not a memorization thing. It's a visualization thing, right? Number two, which one doesn't belong? The graph of which function does not belong with the other three? Explain. Well, I assume that three of these are the same exact function because two of them are standard form. One's intercept form, one's vertex form. Now what I can do, there are a lot of things and maybe I can play with this a little bit, but I can do rewrites of any of these assuming they're actually doable. Like let me check on the standard form ones. Actually, let me, let me do those ones last. Let me start with the factored form version. Talk about foiling this first. We get three times x squared plus four x minus two x minus eight. And when it distributes, that's 3x squared plus 6x minus 24. Now that's the same thing as this one here. So if I say this is a, then that's also a. So they already line up. Cool. Let's look at the vertex form and expand that one as well. Start by expanding this guy. And we get 3 times, this is x squared plus 2x plus 1. And minus 27. Now we distribute the 3 into this. We get 3x squared plus 6x plus 3 minus 27 which combines to become 3x squared plus 6x minus 24. So this one also is an A with those other ones. That means this one's different. This is B. Now, my explanation will be in my math stuff, but these all transform to be the same standard form one here. This is a different standard form one right there. Now, if I go up to this A as well, I want to show a couple things on this, how I can go to factored form, or I should really call it intercept form. But factored form, I do it by factoring. Start with the greatest common factor of 3, you get x squared plus 2x minus 8. Then you find what two numbers multiply to make negative 8 and add to make 2. Those are 4 and negative 2. x plus 4 times x minus 2. And you have your factored form. That should match with this. Oh, they wrote x minus 2 first. But that should match up with that, right? If it's factorable, you can factor it. 
Now from here, we could also do vertex form. Now you just saw an example of how to go to vertex form with something like this. You complete the square. So this would be y equals, and you first factor the three out, but not from every term. This time you only factored out from the first two terms because that 24 is not gonna, the negative 24 is going to be something that sits on the outside right here. Now I'm keeping it on the same side of the equation. So whatever I add right here, I'm actually going to subtract right here and make sure it multiplies by three because this is also going to multiply by three. Two divided by two is one and one squared is one that goes here and here. And then this factors into x plus one quantity squared. Negative 24 minus three is negative 27. So this should now match up with this and it does. Now this one, I don't know if what the factored form and uh, vertex form look like. Let's go and take a look. As far as factored form goes, it might not factor. Uh, three factors out of here, but you get x squared plus eight x minus two. And yeah, that's the extent to which you can factor. That's not even truly factored form because it can't reveal intercepts using that. I don't even know if this thing has it. Well, I guess it has intercepts, but they're not rational. It will have a vertex form though. Vertex form should be the same completing the square thing where you factor three out of the first two terms, you get x squared plus eight x. You're gonna complete the square inside there while the minus six hangs out and subtracts whatever you add inside there, provided that it multiplies by three. Whoops. Eight divided by two is four and four squared is 16. So that goes here. And then here you get three times x plus four quantity squared. And this is negative six minus 48, which is negative 54. Clearly a different equation than this one, and that clearly shows that this is different than that. Now I bring all that stuff up not knowing what stuff we will and won't do. I know that factoring comes later in a lot of what we do in general in this book, so maybe they're not expecting you to play with that much right now, but I still wanted to confirm everything you might have heard in the past, even if it was IM2, and maybe it helps tease things in the future. <laughs> Excuse me. Or maybe you don't look at these problems at all, this vocabulary and core concept checked. I know. I know I generally don't assign them to my students. All right, guys, before I start all this other stuff here, I'm going to get a sip of water to uh, kind of alleviate those hiccups I might have. Give me one second, and then we'll start the problems 3 to 84. Okay, are you ready? Let's do this. In numbers 3 through 14, graph the function, label the vertex and axis of symmetry. All of these are in some form of vertex form, it looks like. Even that last one, which I'm already calling out, you might argue it's standard form. You could. You're not wrong. I could also argue it's vertex form. The x minus h is just x minus 0. So all these have some vertex form thing in it when they say label vertex. I gotcha. In fact, I'll probably even do... I want to tell you what the vertex is first. Uh, the a is 1. The k is 0. The vertex is at hk, which is at 3, 0. The axis of symmetry, let me try that again. The axis of symmetry will be at x equals the h value, which is x equals 3. Okay, so I'm going to be using this kind of graph paper right here, these graph axes. I'll put that, I'll attach that. Um, vertex is at 3, 0. Axis of symmetry is x equals 3. It might be of your benefit to get it drawn beforehand because, you know, I do reflect the points over, right? I do the reflection over. So if I draw it now, it's an orange. It's very light. That's hard to see. Let me, use, let me use green. I made it very small. Let me thicken it out as well. So let's use green. Actually, that's fine. Now, you see the axis of symmetry, hopefully, and this is where we do the points in reflection stuff. The, the um, stretch factor is 1. So this is a typical 1, 1, reflect. 2, 4, reflect, 3, 9, reflect, and 4, 16, if you can fit it, which I can, reflect. And from there, we can draw a curve. I guess we'd be done. They did say to label your vertex and axis of symmetry. I did write what they were before. I'll just call it V and AOS on the actual thing itself. So this is V, and this here is a O S. All right, that's number three. Let's go to number four. <laughs> One problem down. 80, 81 to go. Number four, H of X equals X plus four quantity squared. The vertex is at negative four comma zero. The axis of symmetry is at x equals negative 4. 
All right, so always going to be a vertical line, always going to be an x equals equation, and always going to go through your vertex. So let's start with x equals negative 4. Let's draw ourselves a bo, 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 axis of symmetry. And then let's plot our points once again, stretch factors 1. 1, 1, reflect. 2, 4, reflect. 3, 9, reflect. 4, 16, reflect. When I say reflect, remember I'm counting the same distance away from the axis of symmetry on one side as I do on the other side. So when that last one I did was four away, the other side is still four away. It's probably faster to do a reflection than it is to go over four and up 16 again, if that makes sense. The vertex, once again, vertex and axis of symmetry. When they say label, I guess that's what they want me to do in that way. I already wrote what they are over here, and I want to use that information to then make them afterward. So number five, we now have to use both h and k to plot the vertex, but it doesn't change our stretch factor or anything like that. Our g of x equation is x plus 3 quantity squared plus 5. Our vertex, hk, is at negative 3, 5. The k stays the same. The axis of symmetry is at x equals negative 3, still just the h value. See, the 5 might be at a different height than what it was before. It might not be on the x-axis. That doesn't change the axis of symmetry. In fact, this time, let me do the axis of symmetry first. This is at x equals negative 3. Now, on this, because we're going to have to do this later for standard form and intercept form and stuff like that, the axis of symmetry is here. But somewhere on this is the y value, the vertex. Where? In this case, it's 5. Vertex form will tell us that, but it's got to be on there. Stretch factor is still positive 1. 1, 1, reflect, etc. 2, 4, 3, 9. 5 plus 9 is 14, so I go up there, and I can't fit 4, 16 on this particular graph. So I'm just going to plot those ones and sketch that curve. Okay. Let's go to number 6 on the next page. y equals, not function notation, x minus 7 quantity squared minus 1. This uh, vertex will be at 7, negative 1. So surely we can fit the 16 this time. The axis of symmetry, x equals where? Yep, 7. I don't think I labeled the vertex on the previous problem. I apologize. I hope you can forgive me. I noted where it was. All right, 7, negative 1. Ooh, fitting 4 on this other side might be a little tough. Axis of symmetry is here as well. So 1, 1, 2, 4. 3, 9 should be fine here, I guess. 9 up from there is 8. It's just hard to see where it is. And 4, 16 is going to be a little off. Let me first do it on this side. 16 up is 15. And then on this side, it kind of. Sometimes things will go off the grid. I bet they're going to challenge us even more later. I don't want to get a sneak peek of it too much, but my guess is it'll come. We've seen it before. We saw it in the previous section, I think. Okay. Uh, let's label before we forget. Vertex and axis of symmetry. So, so far, stretch factor has been one each time. It hasn't even flipped over yet. I imagine changes soon. Yep. Both changes right now. Number seven. Number seven, we have y equals negative four times x minus two quantity squared plus four. Now we're not talking about mins and maxes just yet, but as this thing flips over, it'll no longer be a min. It'll now be a max. The vertex is at two, four. Axis of symmetry at x equals two. Let's get that guy plotted and graphed out. Now, the vertex is here, but it is a maximum this time, 2, 4. This graph is going to go downward, and it's going to go downward fast and sharp. So axis of symmetry on that line, or is that line, through the vertex. So multiply, go down and multiply these things by 4. 1, 1 times 4. 2, 4 times 4. That's 16 down from 4, which is negative 12. So I can reflect these across right here. Maybe it's faster <clears throat> to plot in one set. I don't know. But there we go. I can't fit 3 over and 36 down, most unfortunately. 
Remember, 36 comes from 9 times 4. We're going down because it's negative. So there we have it. Our vertex, your highness, and our axis of symmetry. <clears throat> Number 8. G of x equals 2 times x plus 1 quantity squared minus 3. <coughs> Excuse me. I wonder if my voice will last <laughs> through this. Let me move this down a little bit. All right. Vertex is at negative 1, negative 3. Axis of symmetry. Whoops. That looks weird. 4y. There we go. x equals negative 1. Let's do the axis of symmetry first this time, just because I already prepped. Vertex is at negative 1, negative 3. Stretch factors 2. Vertical stretch factors 2. Over 1 up 2. Over 2 up 4 times 2. 8 up from negative 3 is 5. Can I fit over 3 up 18? 18 up from negative 3 is 15. Yes, I can. Right there. If I can, I shall. Nice tall curve. This shouldn't be V-shaped. I know sometimes I have trouble with this. I've talked about that stylus-wise. That curve's looking a little bit better. It should really curve off at the bottom, basically, by the progressive nature of it. It's not a V-shape. It's not a slope. Uh, vertex and axis of symmetry. Okay. Number nine. Oh, I see some fractions later. So number nine. This one has a lot of minuses on it. Now, the one minus that I'm not going to say doesn't matter, but is opposite of what we know it as is the uh, H value, the vertex. That's the one. Vertex is at one, negative five. And then axis of symmetry also, I guess, is positive. But the other two negatives kind of work in tandem with each other because we're facing downward and we're translating downward. So with the vertex at 1, negative 5, this is a maximum. We're just going to go downward from here. Not much wiggle room to fit very many items. I can probably go 212, but that's it. Um, axis of symmetry, though, going down there. Okay. So we're going over 1, down 2. And over 2, like I said, down. Oh, I said down 12. That's not down 12. It's down 8. Over 2, down 8. And 8 down from there is just negative 13. So let's see, 5, 10, negative 13. Like so. I can't fit over 3 down 18. So just 5 points in total. Oh, no. Okay. Not smooth. Sorry. I don't think you care. I'll care if yours are bad, though. Number 10. This is the same thing on the other side in that uh, we'll see what we can fit because it goes up and then it goes up, up, up. So we have h of x. So these are all positives. 4 times x plus 4 quantity squared plus 6. And remember, with that inside h value being positive, it's truly actually negative. Negative 4, 6. Axis of symmetry at x equals negative 4. Okay. So this one, we'll see if I can even fit the fourth and fifth sets of points. I don't know. I'm not convinced I can. So this is at negative 4, 6, at least not within this window range. I don't think I can. Uh, axis of symmetry is here. But I still want to give the effect, right? Here's the problem of only having three points in total. Over 1, up 4, and over 2, up 16. 4 times 4, right? 16 up from 6 is 22. That's way up there. I could simulate it from this graph up here. Like this could be 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. It could technically be like right there. And then here's the axis. And over on this side would be like that. So I can get the idea of it. And the only reason I'm just giving you this idea is because here's what you want to avoid, right? You don't want to have this thing go straight like a V shape with only those two sets of points. Totally missed. And you also don't want it to go vertical. You know what people tend to do here? Is they tend to go straight up from here. This is a bad thinking of how we do these parabolas. Never before were they like that. The domain should be all real numbers. It should be able to keep going out, right? It's going out to a next set of points. So try and avoid the following. Try and avoid going straight up. 
try and avoid crossing through an x value that you didn't yet get the y value for, right? If you crossed x equals negative 2, I better be hitting a y value there. Why didn't you plot the point? Because it's farther away. So there's a tricky bit between how far you do and don't go. So I'm not going to go all the way to that top, but I am going to simulate the effect of what you probably should be doing on these graphs. And I'll show you one third thing that you can do. It's a little, um, I'm not sure what the word is. It's a little loophole-ish, but I guess technically whatever. I guess you could also just stop at your last points that you hit. Maybe just stop at those points and say, all right, I showed you a curve and I didn't have any other points to hit, so I stopped there. Who said you had to go all the way to the top of your window range with your curve? I just say go as far as you can with your points. So I guess it's a little loophole-ish, but there you go. Anyway, there's vertex and axis of symmetry. I tried to aim toward those two points up there, you can see, and it is still curving outward, but it never hit the X's and it never went vertical, much less went backwards and around. That's, that's just terrible line of thinking, of course, or terrible artistry. Either way, heed my cautions. Maybe your teachers won't care, but I do. I do. Number 11, y equals negative 1 fourth times x plus 2 quantity squared plus 1. This is our first instance of, uh, you won't see anything different really with vertex and axis of symmetry, but this is our first instance, at least in this section, of a fraction stretch factor. In this case, a compression factor. Dividing your numbers by 4 instead of multiplying by 4. And yes, it does flip over. So your x equals, uh, let's see, negative 2, 1. x equals negative 2 axis of symmetry. And this is where I get to probably fit a lot more points that I can plot. I'm going to divide 1 by 4 and get a quarter. I'm going to divide 4 by 4 and get 1. 9 divided by 4 is 2 and a quarter. 16 divided by 4 is 4. This is 4 down from the vertex height. 25, 5 squared divided by 4 is 6 and a quarter. 36 divided by 4 is 9. Woo, I can fit it all. 49 divided by four is 12 and a quarter. 64 divided by four is 16. 13, 14, 15, 16. Isn't that precious? I'm going to stop at that one. That's a lot, man. I'm proud. I'm proud of us. Look at what we've accomplished. How fast we can do that even without a table, especially without a table. Now, if it were up to you, you might say, uh, I only want to hit the integer values. In that case, go by the multiples of 2, because at least you square them, and they be definitely become multiples of 4 each time. Okay, vertex, axis of symmetry. We're following the book instructions. Go us. Number 12. One half, not quite as wide as this one was. Let me get it on this next page. y equals 1 half times x minus 3 quantity squared plus 2. All right. Yeah? Okay, let's get the axis of symmetry first, because why not? So x equals 3. Our vertex is somewhere on there. Let me just blindly, uh, maybe right there, pin the vertex on the axis of symmetry. All right. And a one-half stretch factor. Over one, up half of one. Over two, up half of four. Over three, up half of nine. That's at four and a half, mind you. Over four, up half of 16. And eight up from two is 10. Over five, up half of 25, 12 and a half. So eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 and a half. And that's as fittingly awesome as I can get. And it ain't too bad. Okay, arrows, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned arrows each time. Domain, all real numbers, all that stuff. Okay, I don't know what that is. All right, two more on this first block of problems, but at least it's still problems nonetheless. This one's interesting, for me even, because generally we deal with things in terms of fractions. I guess I can stick with the decimal approach for it, or I can convert it in fraction form. 0.4 is also two-fifths. 
I don't know which one's going to be better to work off of. I'll keep the point 0.4 in mind. I think these will be easy enough calculations to work off of. Let's give it a shot. Remember, multiplying by 0.4 is the same as multiplying by 4 and then, you know, moving the, moving the decimal, right? It is a vertical compression. Uh, vertex is at 1, 0. Don't forget the uh, plus 0 being there. Okay, so with this one, let's give this a shot. Again, a little different, but if it's a problem provided, it is a problem to be answered. All right, one zero with yay axis of symmetry. Now, point 0.4. So over one up one times point 0.4, that'll be point 0.4. It's about a half, a little less. Over two up four times point 0.4. Now, four times four is 16, so this will be 1.6 over 2 up 1.6 little little more than a half way up whoops halfway up between those over 3 up 9 times 0.4 so 9 times 4 is 36 so instead it's 3.6 hopefully you're getting that gist right 1 2 3.6 yeah that's fine otherwise we'd be doing 9 times 2 fifths which is 18 fifths which is 3 and 3 fifths you know maybe you're not as fast on that trigger uh, over 4 up 16 times 0.4, that'll be 6.4. So 4, 5, 6.4. A lot of these are 0.4s and 0.6s. Will that change? I have no idea. Over 5 up 25 times 0.4, that's 10. So will it change? Yes. So over 5 up 10. Let's make that a big boy. Plot as many as you can fit, right? What's 36 times 0.4? 14.4. 11, 12, 13, 14.4. I'm guessing that's the last one that can fit as it gets progressively taller. So, not bad. That's fine. I saw the next one is 0.75, though. I'm not going to be doing something like that, multiply by 75 and all that. I'd rather turn that into three quarters. You know what I mean? I'm, I know I'm jumping the gun, but as I draw a curve, that's a pretty curve. I like that one. Take a picture of that. All right, vertex and axis of symmetry. All right, last one in this set, number 14, it is indeed that 0.75. Now, this one doesn't have a, a visible H value. That does mean H is zero. Uh, or if you call it standard form, then this is the A term, and there's no B term, and the C term's negative five, which means that's also your Y-intercept. But the vertex is indeed at zero, negative five, axis of symmetry at X equals zero. That's the Y-axis. So we're symmetrical across the Y-axis, I mean, it's kind of hard to draw it. You can, I just don't know if you'll be able to see it. So let's just draw the axis of symmetry as that vertical line right there. Okay, I don't know if you can see it or not. But vertex is at 0, negative 5, and this goes upward. Now, another way to write this equation, as I stated, was 3 fourths x squared minus 5. So I'll try and deal in those terms, see if that works out. Still a vertical compression. We know how to take a quarter. See, I'd rather divide by four than multiply by three, maybe. I don't know if you're going to feel better or worse about that. But um, not just do times three quarters, just times three quarters in general. We'll convert to the mixed number after. So three quarters of one is indeed three quarters. Three quarters of four is three. Three quarters of nine. Yeah, let's, let's uh, do the multiplication first. Nine times three is 27, and 27 fourths is six and three quarters. So three, four, five, six and three quarters. 16 times three quarters is 12. So it looks like every other one is landing on a, a good number. I, th I think that makes sense because it did before. What was this? Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Was that four squared? Yep, five. 25 times 3 quarters, 75 quarters is 18 and 3 quarters. So what's 18 up from that? It's 13. So 13, 18 and 3 quarters. And I think that's the last one we can fit there. That was a little trickier. Didn't stop me from doing what I'm doing. And the reflection piece is there anyway. So it does half the problems for me just by flipping it over. Can't stop the train from rolling. Okay. Cool. All right. That's the first set of problems, and I'm sure there's a lot of graphing still to be had in the future. Those were just vertex form. 
and let's keep going all right numbers 15 through 18 use the axis of symmetry to match the equation with with its graph doesn't really sound like we have to actually do graphing because they have the graphs there so i'm going to copy very little on this problem i'm going to write down the problem i'm going to tell you what the axis of symmetry should be based on this axis of symmetry should be x equals three right same as the x value of the vertex so which one has an axis of symmetry of x equals three it's c c is x equals three so that's the answer there so i'm just using the graph on that side i'm not actually copying it over i hope that's okay because we don't have to actually match so to speak you just gotta seek seek number 16 y equals x plus four quantity squared minus two this axis of symmetry will be at x equals negative four so which one has that looks like d whoa looks like d does now i'm not looking at the rest of the graph too much we could look at the vertex they said use it to axis of symmetry to match the equation we could look at the vertex as well but let's practice them axes of symmetry so that's d again look at the rest of the graph see if it makes sense to you but since we just did so many in vertex form i think i've practiced myself out you know i think the rest can go in line now i'm just answering the question being asked one half times x plus one quantity squared plus three this axis of symmetry is at x equals negative one so that'll be b it's gonna be bay and then number 18 will be y equals well process of elimination but it's gonna be a so x minus 2 quantity squared minus 1 now you can look at other things I did mention the vertex you can also look at the whoops I also mentioned you can um, I didn't mention you can also look at the stretch factor So although this one matches the x equals 2 as a, um, you know, there's that one that has a one half compression factor, I should say. So that's the wider graph. And then there's the taller graph right here, which has a stretch factor of 2. So a couple other ways you can match some of these parts up if you're so inclined to do so. And that is the four that we just did right there. C, D, B, A. Okay. Let's move on to number 19 and 20. Use the axis of symmetry to plot, to plot the reflection of each point and complete the parabola. Okay, this time I'm actually going to copy this thing over. And uh, this is going to be one of the faster sets of problems I can do. Oh, don't tell me you crashed. Hold on. I don't think it did, but it's not pasting. There it goes. Okay. If you remember, I had these things crash. On the quiz review if you followed me on that all right i'll draw it i guess i'll draw it in green i don't want it to look like uh, the blue that's there so we reflect these across one away two away like so and then we complete the graph there did they say state what the points were let me check because i generally don't do that plot the reflection of each point nah i'm just writing them there's a little overlap. I don't want to get in the way of what they wrote, but that is three comma two and that's four comma negative one. All right, number 20. The hardest part about this is the copying and pasting portion. Number 20, because it's where I'm most prone to have a crash. Well, these are the same old stretch factors of like one, one, two, four, things like that. So one away. Oh, that's in black. One away. Two away. There we go. That's all they wanted, right? I got to read the instructions one more time. That seemed a little quick. Use the axis of symmetry to plot the reflection of each point. Yeah, that's it. All right, let's move on to numbers 21 to 30. 10 questions where we graph the function, label the vertex, and axis of symmetry now these are written in standard form so in standard form we i mean listen we can transform forms i don't think that's really their goal or intent for these problems their goal is to use standard form to do the graphing so i'm going to follow suit with that as long as it seems appropriate to do so and i don't see why it won't be now this is standard form one thing i do want to bring about here is they did mention axis of symmetry yada yada one thing i want to talk about here is your y-intercept your y-intercept is going to be at 0, 1. 
I want you to remember that when it comes to our actual graph and how that works out. I'm not going to uh, foretell it right now. I'm just going to remind you that, oh, that's one of the points that you can have on your graph and its reflecting point. Assuming the y-intercept is not on the axis of symmetry, you can get two points out of it instead of just one. Okay, so the vertex is going to be, uh, the x value is going to be at negative b over 2a. Now b is 2, a is 1, and negative 2 over 2 is negative 1. The y value for this, you're going to substitute negative 1 into your equation. So we do negative 1 squared plus 2 times negative 1 plus 1. That's 1 minus 2, which is negative 1, plus 1 is 0. So your vertex is at negative 1, 0. Negative 1 for x, 0 for y. Your axis of symmetry is this x equals negative 1, by the way. So keep that in mind. They did say label vertex and axis of symmetry. I want to at least call out what they are here. This guy, and maybe this should be in black, right? Right here. All right, let's do the graph for this one now. I'll use the tall graph stuff as I was doing before. Not that, not you, you silly. We already did your thing. All right, so we have the vertex at negative one, zero. We have the axis of symmetry at x equals negative one, no surprise. My stretch factor is still the a value of one. <laughs> of one like that. So that doesn't change how I do what I do beyond this. One, one, two, four, three, nine, four, sixteen, and graph. Now I did want to bring about the fact that I did state that the axis is not the axis, the uh, y intercept is at the point zero one. Notice that point zero one is on this graph, which means it's a point that I'm confirming works with everything I did, vertex, stretch factor, yada, yada. So it's something you could kind of cheat and put up on your own, especially if you're not too keen on the whole stretch factor thing that I'm doing. You can at least get those points on there if you want to. I'm sure the book really seems to, uh, it seems to encourage that. They seem to find their points. I, I know they're not really using a table, but they seem to find their points after the vertex on these based on the y-intercept and choosing an x value that's beyond that kind of table-esque without doing an official table. The only one I'm substituting in to find a value is the y value of the vertex. All right, number 22. y equals 3x squared minus 6x plus 4. We're going to begin by finding the vertex or the axis. Let's, let's just call it axis of symmetry. We're going to begin by finding the axis of symmetry, which is the x value of the vertex. It'll be x equals negative b over 2a, that's 6 over 6, which is 1. So x equals 1 is the axis of symmetry, right? That's kind of my label there. I hope you're okay with the x equals being over there and the 1 being there. The uh, y value of the vertex, we substitute 1 into here. We get 3 minus 6 plus 4, which is also 1. So your vertex is at 1, 1. Your stretch factor is 3, and your y-intercept is 4. So if there's something I'd like to put in to begin with, maybe you start off, watch this, before the vertex, maybe I start off with, I got my axis of symmetry, I got a point on this graph that's right here. Because of the y-intercept, that means there's also a point that's on this side. I don't know where the vertex is yet, somewhere on this line, but I know these are over here. Now, we do know the uh, vertex is at 1, 1, which is right here. And now this seems to agree because my stretch factor was 3. So this goes 1, 3, and that works out. Now, 2, 12 is next on the horizon because we got to do 4 times 3. And so that's those points there. That's all I can fit. And I'd be done besides my labeling of vertex and axis of symmetry. And a curve with arrows, of course. Should be going upward. Okay. So we got vertex axis of symmetry, I'll kaput. Number 23, y equals negative 4x squared plus 8x plus 2. Oops, write the problem, Mr. Robinson. Okay, let's kind of do what I was saying before. Let's plot what we already know this time. See if maybe this is the order you like. Hey, I have a y-intercept of 2. That's a point I have on my graph. 
Now let's find the axis of symmetry so we can reflect across that. Axis of symmetry is at x equals negative b over 2a, which is negative 8 over negative 8, which is 1. So x equals 1 is the axis of symmetry. So it's going to be right here. That means that this y-intercept is 1 away from there. So a corresponding point is also 1 away from there at the same height. So maybe you start with that. Now my vertex is somewhere on this line. I got to substitute 1 for x. I don't want to sound sarcastic, but I got to substitute 1 for x to find this thing. Now I mentioned this, by the way, this is another pattern I want to call out. I've mentioned this in previous things in IM2. You might notice that the first two terms in standard form when plugging in the x value of the vertex will always change this sign. Like, hold on, this becomes negative 4 plus 8, right? And then plus 2. Negative 4 plus 8 turns to positive 4. It takes whatever this number is and turns it positive. I'm not saying that that's crucial to your knowledge, but sometimes uh, if the numbers are hard to obtain, like if they're fractions or something like that, or if they're big, like negative 72 plus 144, let's go to the calculator. No, no, no it's going to be 72. So it always flips whatever that sign is from the first two terms. The last term is still there, but um, I'm just mentioning on those two fronts that that's what you have. So we got a vertex now of 1 comma 6, and that's going to be right up here, 1 comma 6. Now, does this seem to work out? I think so, because the stretch factor was 4, negative 4, that's 1 down 4. And then we'll go 2 over 2 down, 16. 16 down from 6 is negative 10. And that's the extent to where I can go. So that's that biz. Anyway, I'll probably call those things out for standard form as I flip those signs. That is actually what I do in my head when I said it out loud before, when I said, oh, and negative 3 plus 6 is 3 or whatever. Um, I'm just turning the negative 3 into a 3. I'm not even calculating, to be honest. It's just a pattern that I know at this point. Okay, that's number 23. Let's go to number 24, where we begin looking at function notation. Now, I personally prefer function notation because when I substitute my value in for x to find y, I can clearly show what I'm doing at that stage. Um, f of x equals negative x squared minus 6x plus 3. Let's continue that path at least one more time here on plotting the y-intercept first to keep reminding you it's something you can use in standard form. It's one of your benefits and then obtaining the axis of symmetry, which is the same as the x value of your vertex anyway. So we got negative b over 2a. a is negative 1. It's the number in front of x squared, which is that. So 6 over negative 2 is negative 3. x equals negative 3. This time it's a little further out from your y-intercept. So the other corresponding point is also 3 away over here like that. So a little farther out, right? Uh, you can still reflect it and get that. As far as the y value, this is where I like this more. You get to write f of negative 3 equals. Just reminds you that you're finding the y specifically when x is negative 3. Now, this is where you got to be careful. This is the opposite of negative 3 quantity squared minus 6 times negative 3 plus 3. I guess another reason I bring up that pattern is to remind you that that should always happen when we do this. So negative 3 squared is 9. Opposite of that is negative 9. Now you'll notice these multiplied become positive 18, which should happen. What did I say before? When you combine these two together, you end up getting the opposite of this number that you see here. What's negative 9 plus 18? 9. Positive 9. And you get 12. And I bring that up because that should always happen here. Not just, oh, it's a pattern for you to recognize. It should happen. What if you turned this into positive 3 and then squared it became positive 9? 9 plus 18 ain't negative 9. You know, it's not like that. So you would have made a mistake there. And that's not one you want to make. Anyway, your vertex is at negative 3, 12, which is a little higher up than we've seen before. But this graph should be going downward appropriately. And it looks like it'll probably hit these points like they should. Negative 1 is the stretch factor. So 1, 1, 2, 4. And this looks to be our 3, 9. Now, I want to keep going. I want to go 4, 16. 16 down from there, I think, is negative 4. Let's see if we can fit 525. What's 25 down from 12? Negative 13. So that should be right here. All right. It's probably the tallest graph we've been able to do so far. Not the widest, but the tallest. The most. Okay.
So I really have to focus. Okay. Intent focus. Vertex. Axis of symmetry. Problem complete. Number 25. How long have we gone? Too long. Number 25. Probably averaging four minutes a problem. G of X equals negative X squared minus one. Interested to see if you know what the X value of the axis of symmetry should be on this one. First of all, Y intercept. I'll, I'll leave that this time because it's going to have to do with vertex. Axis of symmetry is at X equals negative B over 2A. Well, B is zero, right? So what's going to happen here is you're going to get zero for your X value for axis of symmetry. And that's crucial for you to just notice there. See, this doesn't have a B term. With no B term, there's no horizontal shift. It's not the same as H, but it applies to H in certain ways. Remember with completing the square and all that. So we're here. That does make your Y intercept of negative one also be your vertex. Don't believe me? Let's try G of zero. We get opposite of zero squared minus one, which is zero minus one, which is negative one. That means your vertex is indeed at zero negative one. So you should know, <clears throat> or we will note that when in standard form, and there's no B term, your y-intercept is on your vertex, therefore your vertex is on the y-axis, therefore the constant number represents vertex, zero comma constant. Also axis of symmetry, which means we don't get any points to reflect across, which means we have to come up with more on our own. The stretch factor of negative one means we'll go downward, so we got ourselves a one, one, two, four, three, nine, four, sixteen scenario, and this actually bottoms out at negative 17 right there, so the perfect representation of this graph axis that I can use at quick quadratic processing fashion. Okay, cool. Number 26 looks to be the same. It's not the same problem, but it has the same thing. No B term, only a constant and such. So I think we can see right now what's going to go on here f of x equals 6x squared minus 5 i'm not going to deal in terms of negative b over 2a my vertex is at 0 negative 5 the axis of symmetry is x equals 0. if i can identify my vertex first maybe your axis can go right along with it that fast and then we can go straight to graphing right so it's still on the uh, y-axis that is x equals 0. so we got that now, this is a very tall stretch factor. Your y-intercept is indeed the uh, vertex. Very tall stretch factor of 6 over 1 up 6 over 2 up 4 times 6, which is 24. 24 up from negative 5 is negative 20, is negative 19. Um, 17, well, excuse me, is 19. 24 up from negative 5 is 19. 17 is the top right here, so 18, 19 would probably be up there. I want to get something along that route just so I know that I don't actually eclipse it so I'll still get to the top of my window range like this and try and find my way down there the nice steep slope these are the toughest ones for me to graph I'm not really a fan of graphing them doesn't mean that it can, it shouldn't be done the deed must be done the problem must be graphed so even if it's not officially in the window range I wanted to give it the right idea Never go straight up, never cross X values that you didn't get points for. <clears throat> okay, vertex and axis of symmetry. I don't know if that ended up being a quicker problem to do, but that dang curve. Number 27. Not even a third of the way done, y'all. G of X equals negative 1.5 X squared plus 3 X plus 2. You seem a little intimidated by the stretch factor, and I get it, but at least it looks like, well, the axis of symmetry should be fine. I don't know about the vertex. Axis of symmetry is at negative B over 2A, which is negative 3 over negative 3, or 1. Now that vertex, or the uh, Y value, when we do G of 1, that's going to be negative 1.5 times 1 squared, negative 1.5, plus 3, which is positive 1.5, and plus 2 is 3.5. So not the best of values, but we'll see what it actually ends up doing when we do the whole graph with it. So your vertex is at 1, 3.5.
Okay. Let's try this. Let's see what fares best for us when we do this as well. So here's our vertex. What's the y-intercept? Two. So two is here. Axis of symmetry, by the way, goes through that one. X equals one. And uh, reflecting across that two should be one away right there. That should be the point. Now, negative 1.5, this graph should go down, and that does make sense as a first point. One over should be going down one and a half, one times 1 1.5. Now, going over two, instead of going over four, down four, you'll go down four times 1.5, which is six. So over two, down one, two, three, four, five, six. This is always a harder count for me. I feel like I need to count it. I could do the math, but I still want to not make a mistake because I'm counting from the halves. There are easier ways to do it. I just choose to not do them, and that's my fault. Um, over three, instead of going down nine, you got to go down 13 and a half. That's nine times 1.5. So let me try this here. At least three and a half is to here. So 13 and a half is down at the negative 10. I guess I could do the math on it. That's probably the only other point I could fit, though, so I'll leave it at that with the curve. Over four, down 16. 16 times 1.5 is 24. And 24 down from three and a half is a little too low. I think it's negative 20 and a half. I don't think I can be fitting that one with a 17 there. So that'll be my last point I can plot. I got my vertex, got my axis of symmetry. That's number 27. Let's go to number 28. I got three more in this set. 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is the same as one half. I want to remind you of that in case you're... Uh, some people like decimals, some people don't. So I just want to make sure you choose which way you want to go about it. Remember, I turned the 0.75 into three quarters on that one problem. Now, this one has an axis of symmetry, I think at negative one. Let's see. X equals negative B over 2A. Two times 0.5 is one. So negative one over one is negative one. Yep. And then the uh, Y value, F of negative one, we're going to do 0.5 times negative 1 squared plus negative 1 minus 3. Negative 1 squared is 1 times 0.5 is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 minus 1 is negative 0.5. Minus 3 is negative 3.5. This looks a lot like the last problem we did, only negatives. And clearly a different uh, stretch factor. Compression factor, rather. Your vertex is at negative 1, negative 3.5. Remember your y-intercept of negative three, because I'm going down here. You have a y-intercept of negative three. You have an axis of symmetry at negative one. So we can reflect that point across early on if anything else seems intimidating to you. Stretch factors of one half haven't been a problem though for, for me. Remember, times one half also just means dividing by two. So that's how I'm gonna think of it in my head. Not too bad. My only problem is I'm starting from the decimal. So negative 3.5 is down here. The stretch factor is positive, so it makes sense to go up. So over 1, up a half, okay? Over 2, up 2, because that's half of 4, but it is on decimals. Over 3, up 4.5. This one is actually the one, it's the odd numbers that are actually going to add on uh, land on integer values because you're actually on a half, and those are half, something and a half up. So it's this one that's going to land on a, a decimal, but over four, up half of 16, which is eight. So three and a half plus five, uh, five, I think, right there. I'll do a better count of this later. I, wait, I think so. I think that's right. Over five, up 12 and a half. So this is one, two, three and a half. So I need nine left to go. So I'll go up nine. Is that right? No, that seems like a wrong jump there. Hold on. This was over three, up four and a half, five and a half, six and a half, seven and a half, eight and a half, nine, ten and a half, eleven and a half. I'm counting something wrong. Let me let me let me pause and see what I'm doing. Either I'm not doing something wrong or I am. Hold on. Okay, I think the problem was the over four. I think up eight, I think it's supposed to be right here. The spacing spacing looked off, and I think it's supposed to be right there. So that's four and a half plus three and a half is eight. There we go. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, over six, up 18, half of 36, three and a half, 18, 14 and a half right there. All right. I know it's a lot of me kind of figuring things out. Like I said, it's the one half is not the part that bothers me. 
it's counting from that three and a half, negative three and a half on the vertex. That's the troublesome spot. It really shouldn't be. You know what I should do? Because I have the computer. I should um, plot it at, say, negative three. I should plot it at zero and then translate it afterward. That's technically what we're supposed to be doing. Um, okay. So vertex. Axis of symmetry. Okay. Number 29. Ooh, three halves. That's the same as one and a half. And negative five halves. So they are not, not making them easier. Here we go. And again, I couldn't care less whether they use fraction form or decimal form. It's still going to kind of be the same thing there. The problem is the fraction axes of symmetry and stuff, or vertex. Axis of symmetry, x equals negative b over 2a. Now, 2 times 3 halves is just 2. 2 over 2 cancels out there. So we get positive 3 over positive 3, which is positive 1. That's the axis of symmetry. Substitute 1 into here. Now, if you were intent on staying as fractions, I, I will for temporarily. Maybe I will for the whole problem. Three. This is 3 halves minus 3 plus 6. And you might be trying to go common denominator this. Remember, 3 halves minus 3 is negative 3 halves, right? Now, the plus 6, this is where you need a common denominator. 6 is 12 halves. So you get 9 halves. And 9 halves is 4 and a half for the lesser uh, informed. <laughs> So you got 1 comma 9 halves. I'll stick with fraction form. But that's 4 and a half. Okay. Now your y-intercept is 6. And this is x equals 1, axis of symmetry. Again, y-intercept of 6. 9 halves is 4 and a half. And this thing flips over here. Right there. And 3 halves also means 1 and a half. So over 1, up 3 halves of 1. Over 2, up 3 halves of 2, which is 6. So, and I can probably just fit one more. Over 3 up 3 halves of 9, which is 13 and a half. I could say it in different terms. Um, that actually will just not fit. That'll be at 18, but I'll still plot it. Okay. Honestly, these graphs aren't taking significantly longer than any of the other ones we've been doing, so. If anything, like 20 seconds longer. I don't know this. I'm not timing these empirically. All right, number 30, last one of this set. Y equals negative 5 halves X squared minus 4X minus 1. I might have spoken too soon on this, especially because something. You'll see. Uh, this one's going to be a significantly less fun problem. This one's going to take a little bit longer. Negative 5 halves x squared minus 4x minus 1. Now, the main problem with this one is the axis of symmetry is going to be different. Uh, axis of symmetry is going to be at x equals negative b over 2a. Now, these cancel the 2s, which is fine. You get negative 5 down here. But this time, you get 4 over negative 5. Negative 4 fifths. I don't see that as being fun in any way. Now, by the way, the negative, negative times negative is a positive, but there's a negative down here, and that's what leads to the negative fraction. That's also negative 0.8. I'm going to leave it as a fraction, though. It's not fun in one of two ways, finding the y value for the uh, vertex and also graphing. From negative 4 fifths, I have str trouble with one halves. Now fifths, this, this is going to be a little different, um, and we'll see how long how many points I need to actually fit on this graph but I will plot as many as I can fit I am devoted I'm committed I'm committed to the uh, problem here so negative 5 halves times 4 squared is 16 5 squared is 25 plus 16 fifths minus 1 and I should probably put the 1 as something as fifths as well now 5 over 25 is 1 fifth 16 over 2 is 8 so we have negative 8 fifths plus 16 fifths. What do you think negative 8 fifths plus 16 fifths is? Positive 8 fifths. Okay, it goes back to the other side. And then minus 1 is minus 5 fifths, which is 3 fifths. So you have a, oh gosh, so you have a vertex of negative 4 fifths 
comma three fifths. The one saving grace I have on here is the y intercept is negative one, but that's only going to be one point away from there, I do believe. So I have an axis of symmetry at negative four fifths. That alone is hard enough to kind of show as a plotting there. Like, did I plot it well at negative four fifths, or does that look more like, you know, negative seven tenths? You know what I mean? That one's going to be pretty, and I can't even select it. There we go. Should I do it more like that? Probably, actually. I should probably do it more like that. So this alone is going to be difficult to kind of comprehend there. Now, negative four fifths and three fifths is here. And I, I'd stated there's a saving grace in having that y intercept at negative one. Now I suddenly don't know because I got to reflect across negative four fifths to make it negative eight fifths, which is negative one and three fifths, which is right there. There's nothing about this graph that's going to look pretty. I want to guarantee you that. Now over two, we got to go down. What's my stretch factor? Five halves. We got to go down. I'm going to write these out. Five halves times four which is negative 10. Okay, so over two, oh, this, oh, this wasn't even over one. Over one would be at one fifth. Over one is down five halves, so that's one, two and a half. I don't even know if this looks like a perfect point or not. What's two and a half down from the, oh, I don't know, guys. I don't know guys this ain't it you know what I mean you know this this isn't the one anyway over 2 down 10 now 10 from here just go to negative 10 and we'll go 3 fifths up from there we'll go to negative 10 and go 3 fifths up from there honestly that's the only other point I'm committed to plotting I don't think anything else will fit but I think that's the only other point I'm committed to plotting yeah not an ideal graph. Something where, listen, if you want to use the calculator and get your numbers, by all means, be my guest. If you want to use a table here, I'm not going to stop you. I can see why that might, you know, I might have lost you on some of these, especially because I use fractions instead of decimals. Uh, over three, you'd be going down 22 fifths, uh, excuse me, 22.5, uh, which is 55 fifths. I don't know, something fits. But uh, you'd be going down 22.5, which couldn't fit on the graph. Uh, I can do this, though. I can label my vertex and axis of symmetry. But that was not a fun graph. Given that you have 84 questions in this problem set, you don't, I do. Given that I have 84 questions in this problem set, that's among the questions I didn't want to see on number 30. All right, 31 and 32 are writing. So maybe no graphing here. Two quadratic functions have the graphs with vertices 2, 4, and 2, negative 3. Explain why you cannot use the axes of symmetry to distinguish between the two functions. Because they're on the same axis of symmetry. Um, so if, if you're like, hey, this one has an axis, or this one has this vertex, this is this vertex, let's look at their axes of symmetry and tell me which graph has which vertex or whatever. Um, the quadratic functions with vertices of 2, 4, and 2, negative 3 have the same axis of symmetry at x equals 2. Therefore, you cannot use that to distinguish between the two functions. Meaning you can't use the axis of symmetry. You can use the vertices. You can use the stretch factors, whatever else they give you. You just can't use the axis of symmetry. It's the same one. Number 32, a quadratic function. Oh, and we haven't talked about increases and stuff yet. I guess we're getting into that. Probably mins and maxes as well. A quadratic function is increasing to the left of x equals 2 and decreasing to the right of x equals 2. Will the vertex be the highest point or lowest point on the graph of the parabola? Explain. So if I have x equals 2 as my axis of symmetry. And it's increasing to the left of x equals 2, right? My graph is increasing going here. And it's decreasing going to the right of x equals 2, whatever like that. That means you hit a maximum point. Will the vertex be a highest or lowest point? It'll be a highest point. The vertex will be a highest point. You are increasing as you go to the left 
of the axis of symmetry where the vertex is until you start decreasing after that which means you've hit a maximum at that vertex aka the highest point okay there's number 32 here we go numbers 33 and 34 here are the error analysis questions let's check them out describe and correct the error in analyzing the graph of y equals 4x squared plus 24x minus 7. They begin with the x-coordinate of the vertex is x equals b over 2a, which is 24 over 2 times 4 is 3. What they calculated was fine. Their formula is incorrect. Their formula is incorrect. It should be negative b over 2a instead of b over 2a. I'll fix that. Um... I know we're not like deriving where it comes from that thing if you know quadratic formula you can probably discover part of where it is i talked about it back in im2 im2 videos when we did this kind of stuff negative b over 2a negative 24 over 2 times 3. uh you can also use calculus but that's, that's a far cry for you guys right now so it's negative 3 basically it's not positive 3 it's negative 3. i don't think they want us to do anything more than that but that's the x-coordinate of the vertex number 34 the y-intercept of the graph is the value of c, which is x, uh, which is 7. This is kind of a silly mistake. I, it's not one I anticipate many students to have. They're on the right track. They have the right constant. Uh, they, they are seeking the right part of the function constant for the y-intercept of the graph. But it should be negative 7 instead of seven I mean simply it says it says minus seven there a lot of people don't really mess that up you could I expected them to do something else with their mistakes but not that okay let's go to exercises 35 and 36 X is the horizontal distance in feet and Y is the vertical distance in feet of a toss of some sort what is it a shot put? Oh, this is a different question. 35 and 36 are two different questions. Find and interpret the coordinates of the vertex. All right, number 35. The path of a basketball thrown at an angle of 45 degrees can be modeled by, and by the way, the 45 degrees doesn't matter. They're just giving you some scientific fact, I believe, given that this is a horizontal distance on X, vertical distance on Y. They want the coordinates of the vertex. The vertex X value will be at negative b that's one over two a which is negative one over negative point zero four i feel like that's something i don't want to mistake i think it's 25. i don't want to make a mistake on that though so let me get my calculator one over point zero four okay 25. so we get 25 for the x value of the vertex and then we will substitute 25 into the equation to get the y value of the vertex this part, I might use the calculator anyway. 25 plus 6 is 31. Actually, I'm going to leave that because I think this is going to be negative 12 and a half. 225. Oh, boy. Two, uh, 625. 625 times negative 0.02 is, yeah, negative 12 and a half. So negative 12 and a half plus 25 is 12 and a half plus 6, which is uh, 18 and a half. Now, interestingly enough, and I don't know if you heard me, but because I knew this number was already 25 right here, and it's very simple, x is 25, right? Plug it in. Because I knew this was 25, I knew I was going to add a negative version of this number to double that thing over to get the other thing. I was going to add from something to 25 to get the positive version of that something. I was going to add half of 25. Negative 12 and a half would be this number plus 25 is positive 12 and a half. I almost didn't care what this number was. I knew that these two together were going to add to 12 and a half, half of this number. Anyway, um, equals 18 and a half. Anyway, what do I want to say about that? Interpret these. A basketball thrown at an angle of 45 degrees will reach 
its maximum height of 18.5 feet in the air, 25 feet away, horizontally, from the throw. Now, let me write the vertex itself. So you might wonder, wait, why isn't it, if it's 45 degrees, because you might think of 45 as like, you know, exactly halfway. You're like, why, see, I just wrote it wrong. Why wouldn't it be say 25 and 25 if it's at 45 degrees? Well, there's this little thing on earth called gravity. See, you might shoot it at 45 degrees, and I guess we're doing it from ground level, but here's 45 degrees here. It doesn't stay on that path. That's the initial trajectory. You know what happens over time? is it curves, it hits the top and it bottoms out. But this is why this will go farther than this height, at least when it comes to a 45 degree angle. If it was a 60 degree angle or something, maybe we're seeing a different story in that, or a 90 degree angle, we're seeing a different story altogether. But there's this little thing called gravity that's gonna make it slope off that 45 degree angle. Just keep that in mind. All right, that's the answer when interpreted in context. There's the vertex right there. So let's move on to number 36. The path of a shot put released at an angle of 35 degrees, even lower, can be modeled by y equals negative 0 0.01 x squared plus 0.7 x plus 6. All right, let's find out the vertex of that guy. And by the way, oh, they sorry, they did mention vertex. Never mind. All right, so y equals negative 0 0.01 x squared plus 0.7 x plus 6. Let's get the vertex x value, negative b over 2a, which is negative 0.7 over negative 0 0.02, which is 35. Wow, you know, 35 feet would be pretty far for a shot put. Can we, maybe it's 3.5, 0 0.7 divided by 0 0.02, 35. That seems far for a shot put. I want to make sure, is, is my answer right? I want to make sure that that was as, you know, wanted. How far can you throw a shot put? I'm gonna go with 35. I don't. This is a, this is either a slight shot put or a strong person or a combination of both. I, the numbers look like they're good. I just question the lot the uh, actuality of that happening. Anyway, we're gonna substitute 35 into here. Now I'm gonna try and do some makeshift calculator free work on here. I'm gonna try and work out 35 times 7. Let's begin with that. That's two 24. Well, 245. So this is 24.5. And I just want to let you know, I don't know what this calculates to as far. Oh, actually, I do. This is 1225 divided by that. That's negative 12.25. Never mind. I can do that in my head. And negative 12.25 plus 24.5 is positive 12.25. Hey, plus 6, which is 18.25. Mommy, wow. Calculator free. Let's go. So 35 feet out, 18.25 feet up. I think I can... Um, interpret this in better words than I stated last time. I'm going to give this a shot. The shot put reaches, unless I'm going to say the exact same thing, a max height of 18.25 feet when thrown 35 feet outward. I'm saying outward as in horizontally. Uh, at, at 35 feet outward. Maybe that's the better part. Because it still has got to go another, I guess, 35 feet. You know, that's what we're going to do there. Well, I, okay. You know what? I made one little mistake on my statement that I made before about this ground level of the basketball. Basketball is not being thrown at ground level. I didn't look at the model. The model says a plus six. The plus six means it's being thrown six feet from ground level. So this is actually more like right here. And then that max height of 18 point, it's still hitting 18.5 as a max height, but 25 is still, you know, based on the ground here. It's still reading a max height of 18.5. It's just, it won't go 50 feet total. That might explain the shot put thing a little bit more. Not really still, but this is also being thrown six feet from ground level, six feet up. 
but it reached the maximum height of there at that degree, at that angle. Oh, um, when thrown at a 35 degree angle. Whoops. Okay, let's jump to number 37. Analyzing equations. The graph of which function has the same axis of symmetry as the graph of y equals x squared plus 2x plus 2. Now, I think there's only one answer, so I guess when we land on the answer, we'll be good and move on. It didn't sound like it's multiple selection. It says which function, not which functions. So let's look at y equals x squared plus 2x plus 2. Let's find its axis of symmetry. Its axis of symmetry will be at x equals negative b over 2a, which is negative 1. So we got to check all four of these ones and figure out which one also has an axis of symmetry of negative 1. Should, um, I'm not going to write the whole equation. I'm just going to write the this part here. So x equals negative b over 2a. You can see that's going to be negative 1 half. Eh. B is going to be at, I don't think this is going to work. Oh, actually, no, this one might work. Uh, x equals negative b over 2a, which is 6 over negative 6. Yeah, this one is negative 1. So ding. So it looks like it's going to be the equation y equals negative 3x squared minus 6x plus 2. Now, to say out loud what the other ones would have been, c would have had 2 over 2, which is 1. d would have had negative 10 over negative 10, which is 1. So this is the only one with an axis. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We want a negative 1. Okay, this is the only one with an axis of negative 1. Okay, number 38, using structure. Which function represents the widest parabola? Explain your reasoning. So, you know, once again, I'm not going to write more than I need to here. So I'm just going to look at all four with you right now. Widest means most vertical compression, least vertical stretch. The smallest A value is what you want. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative. Okay, just matters absolute value wise, which one has the smallest. That's not zero. Now, this one's two. This one's one. This one's 0.5, which is 1 half. This one's negative 1. So absolute value is all that matters. Negative 1 to me is the same as 1. 2 is narrower because it's taller. 0.5 or 1 half is the smallest. So among, among the four graphs, among, among the four equation functions, y equals, I'm just going to write it, y equals 0.5 x minus 1 squared plus 1 has the is the represents the widest parabola that is because its vertical stretch factor has the smallest absolute value therefore it's the most vertically compressed Now, I also wanted to stress the fact that this was in vertex form, vertex form. You could argue these are both vertex form, sort of. You could also call them standard form. The form doesn't matter. All the forms that we've looked at, vertex form, standard form, and intercept form, all share the same A letter, which represents the same thing. So that number in front is still representing stretch factor, regardless of form that you're using. These could all be argued as vertex form, but that answer should be C. Number 39 to 48, another next 10 questions. Do we have to graph them? Find the min or max of the function. Describe the domain and range of the function where the function is increasing and decreasing. They do not ask us to graph, so I will not graph unless I feel like I want to support something with it. I might make rough sketches, but I'm not going to do the whole copy paste the graph stuff. All right, so number 39. Let's make sure we know the instructions. So y equals 6x squared minus 1. We're going to find the min or max value. So we have to identify which one it is. Describe domain and range and where it's increasing, decreasing. Now, I, I as a rough sketch, 6x squared minus 1, it's an upward facing graph and a very tall one. The vertex 
will help you find the min or max value, at least the y value of it, right? This one actually is symmetrical on the y-axis itself. That means the y-intercept is the vertex. So this actually has a minimum value. Because it bottoms out, it has a minimum value of negative 1. The y value of the vertex is the minimum value. I hope I didn't go too fast on that part. Just because of the nature of this kind of graph, that's what it's going to be. Because the vertex is at 0, negative 1. I don't have to use negative b over 2a for that. This is technically also vertex form. Don't forget that. So there's one part of it. Domain and range. Domain is all real numbers. I can't imagine any of these that won't be all real number domain. Range is limited based off that min value. It goes up from negative 1. Now the increasing, decreasing part, I'm going to do in interval, not uh, in inequality notation. It increases onward from 0 on x. When x is greater than 0, it increases. And it decreases when x is less than 0. When we're talking increase and decrease, we're saying as we go left to right, is the graph going up or down? What as we go left to right, to the left of 0, it's decreasing. As we go left to right, to the right of 0, it's increasing. And that's the third part. So that's what we're going to do on all these problems here. This one might have been a little faster because it, we didn't have to find that vertex, if that makes sense. It depends on whether we're going to be given vertex form, standard form, intercept form, things like that. Looks like these are all supposed to be standard form, but you have to keep in mind on 39 and 40, you can also trick them to be vertex form or just note with no B value, your vertex is on the y-intercept. Is the y-intercept, I should say. It's on, um, yeah, which is 7 in this case. So this also is an upward-facing graph, therefore also has a minimum. It has a minimum value of 7, which means it just goes higher from there. So the graph is kind of like, yoink, like that. That means x equals 0, as the vertex is the other guy. Uh, domain, all real numbers. Range is y is greater than or equal to 7. Now, the increase, decrease, same thing. See, I think I'm going to do those rough sketch graphs whenever I can. It's increasing when x is greater than 0. It's decreasing when x is less than 0. So same thing as before. Goes down to the left of 0, goes up to the right of 0. Now, these other questions are where I'm going to have to do a little bit more work. All right, 41. This time, the y-intercept is not the vertex. With that b value involved, that means there's more I have to do. So I'd like to find the vertex first. The vertex helps me identify the min or max, and it helps me talk about the interval of increasing or decreasing to the left or right of the vertex. So for the vertex, the x value is at negative b over 2a, which is 4 over negative 2, or negative 2. The y value is at opposite of negative 2 squared, Minus 4 times negative 2, minus 2. A lot of negatives. Negative 2 squared is 4. Opposite of that is negative 2. Oh, 4, excuse me, <laughs> is negative 4. Plus 8 is 4. Minus 2 is 2. So your vertex is at negative 2, comma 2. Now, as far as that goes, your graph is also a downward-facing graph. So at negative 2, 2, it faces downward like that. Okay? Boom, boom. 2 and negative 2. So when we talk about maximum, or min versus max, it has a maximum. It has a maximum at 2. It's the y value, maximum at 2. Domain all real numbers. Range, y is less than or equal to that maximum of 2. We go down from there. It increases when x is less than negative 2. Negative 2 is the axis of symmetry. When x is less than negative 2, we're seeing an increase. And we're seeing a decrease when x is greater than negative 2. There we go. All right, number 42. So a lot of the problems, I think, are going to be like that. Like, there's a lot more I kind of have to do when i got to find the vertex and apply that. That rough sketch graph, I think, really helps for it. All right, g of x equals negative 3x squared minus 6x plus 5. So again, for vertex, uh, axis of symmetry, negative b over 2a is negative 1. The y value, oh, the y value when x is negative 1 is 1 squared is a negative 3 plus 6 is 3 plus 5 is 8. So your vertex is at negative 1, 8. Okay, it's a downwards facing graph at negative 1, 8. 
right there. Do, 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 negative one and eight, all that kind of stuff, downwards facing graph. It's a maximum at eight. So it has a max of eight. Domain is all real numbers. Again, I don't think that's gonna change. Range, y is less than or equal to eight. We are increasing to the left of negative one, increasing, decreasing to the right of negative one. And hopefully me saying that out loud because that's kind of how they say it in the book, right? Me saying, me saying X is great. Honestly, this is how we tend to say it, really. The book is using words. So I'm gonna say out loud the words as I write the inequality notation. You might even be forced to use interval notation, which I'm not currently doing. Number 43, f of x equals negative 2x squared plus 8x plus 7. Let's start with z vertex. Vertex really reveals almost everything we need to know about the problem. Let me try this without the visual of the graph, see if you guys can follow along with it. Actually, I'll do this one more time like this. After that, we'll stop using the visual. First half, visual. Next half, no visual. So x is negative b over 2a which is two. Now we'll take f of two. And we get negative eight plus 16, which is eight plus seven, which is 15. So we get a vertex of two comma 15. So one more time with the visual guys. Last time with the visual, at least if I feel like it's not necessary after that, two comma 15 is up there, right? Two and 15, axis of symmetry doing that. Negative is downward facing. A lot of downward facing graphs recently means we have another maximum. We have a maximum of 15, highest point. And I, and you know what, and I'm glad they did the word problems before it. The shot put in basketball, they help remind you about what maximum truly means. What's its maximum height? Oh, 15 feet, right? It's not two. Two is how far off it goes. Two is how many seconds it takes to get there. It's not the maximum, the maximum is the Y. When it occurs is the two, the shot is increasing up for two seconds and then after two seconds it goes down, stuff like that. It's a good reminder of why word problems can kind of best what we're doing here. Domain all real numbers, range Y is less than or equal to 15. And it increases all the way up till when X equals two. So when X is less than two, we're increasing, we're decreasing when X is greater than two. Okay. Let's do the rest of them. Try and do it without the visual. I might still kind of do arcs and stuff like that, but I want to see if we can go visual less and still do all that work. So number 44, how long have we gone? Not yet two hours, ha ha ha. G of X equals three X squared plus 18 X minus five. Okay, so, hmm, vertex, X is negative B, over 2a, which is negative 18 over 6, which is negative 3. g of negative 3 for the y value for the win. We're going to get 9, 27, minus 54, which is negative 27, minus 5, which is negative 32. So the vertex is at negative 3, negative 32. The graph faces upward. From there, I'm not gonna draw a visual. It's an upward facing graph with the bottom at negative 32. That is a minimum. We have a minimum at negative 32. Domain is all real numbers. The range, we go everything higher than 32. Y is greater than or equal to negative 32 there. And because it's an upward facing graph, we decrease till we hit the X value of the vertex, we increase afterward. So we increase after X equals negative three, so we Whoops, so x is greater, ah, when x is greater than negative three, we increase. I almost feel like I need the visual. And we decrease when x is less than negative three. Go down to it, then pop back up. No visual, all done. Let's see if we can keep that up. Number 45. Number 45, h of x equals two x squared minus 12 x. Hmm, y intercept of zero, okay. I already know what the uh, min is going to be. Okay, so uh, vertex x equals negative b over 2a, which is 12 over 4, which is 3. Now, when I plug in 3, I should be getting 0 out for y. 
because the y-intercept is zero. Forget what I just said. That doesn't have anything to do with vertex. Y-intercept isn't always vertex. Forget what I just said. Forget what I just said. Let's calculate this. 2 times 3 squared minus 12 times 3. All right, this will be, um, I don't know why I said that, 18 minus 36, which is negative 18. It's got a y-intercept of 0. That's not the same as the vertex. Da, 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 da. Vertex is at 3, negative 18. Okay, so we got uh, upward-facing graph. That means we have a minimum. The minimum is negative 18. The domain, all real numbers. Hey, the range, y is greater than or equal to negative 18. Box that up. We're increasing after the 3, and we were decreasing leading up to the 3. Okay. Sorry about that zero talk. All right, number 46. Same kind of thing as this previous problem. They, they really like an odd number and then the next even number to kind of be the same. They're like, hey, we'll get the odd answers in the back of the book and try the even one after that. Teacher will try a problem, then you try a problem next to it. So that's why they kind of seem to line these up in that way quite often. Um, mm -hmm. uh, vertex. X equals. Now, I, there, I have other preferences to find the vertex in these kind of cases here. I like to factor it and then take half the average. Well, I don't know, it, it depends on the problem. But this one here, I'd have other ways of finding the vertex probably. But I agree, it's two, vertex is two. For the x value, the y value, two squared minus four times two, that is four minus eight, which is negative four. Hopefully you've still seen that pattern that I've been bringing up. The vertex is at two, negative four. All right, another upwards facing graph. We haven't seen a downwards one in a while, probably next, but upwards facing means a minimum. Minimum's negative four. Mm, a real number domain and a range of greater than or equal to negative four as we go upward. Whew, been fast writing lately. We're increasing after two to the right of two. We're decreasing to the left of two, getting down to there. Okay, two more in this set. Fractions on 47 and 48 for the A value that might not affect, well, it might. Might affect our uh, min max, but it might not affect the x value to vertex. Let's take a look. Y equals 1 fourth x squared minus 3x plus 2. The x value will be at negative B over 2A. All right, 2 times 1 fourth is 1 half. We're going to do 3 divided by 1 half which means three times two over one, which is six. Excuse me. So that one's still pretty clean. The, um, when X is six, this still might be clean as well. Six squared minus three times six plus two. Here we're going to get six squared, which is 36 over four, which is nine. Nine minus 18 is negative nine. How appropriate, plus two, which is negative seven. So your vertex is at six, negative seven. Despite the weirdness of that, I don't care about that one fourth anymore. I care that it's positive. Positive tells me I'm at a minimum. Minimum is negative seven, but the one fourth itself doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't hurt me rest of the way. We're all good. It's all about these two numbers and being positive here. Domains all real numbers because that thing's positive. Range is y is greater than or equal to negative seven. And we're increasing when x is greater than six and decreasing when X is less than six. All right, let's see if number 48 shares the same fate in a good way that we land on integers despite the fraction. Oh, let's see, 48 F of X equals three halves X squared plus six X plus four the vertex x value is at negative 6 over 2 times 3 halves. 2 times 3 halves is 3. So we got negative 6 thirds, which is negative 2. Good fortune so far. The y value is going to be 3 halves times negative 2 squared. Oh, this will be fine. Plus 6 times negative 2 plus 4. Negative 2 squared is 4. 4 halves is 2. <laughs> 2 times 3 is 6. So 6 minus 12 is negative 6, plus 4 is negative 2. So vertex is at negative 2, negative 2. We're going to see a lot of negative 2s on this problem. 
there were three minimums or three maximums in a row from 41 to 43 after that. And I should have just looked at it. All the A's have been positive since then. Bunch of minimums after that. Versatility on that or variety has been a little shaky. It's minimum at negative two because of this negative two, not that one. That's the only thing that'll be tricky here. Uh, domain. Hey, all real numbers. Range. Y is greater than or equal to negative two because of this one, not that one. And we're increasing when X is greater than negative two because of this one, not that one. And we're decreasing when X is less than negative two because of this one, not that one. And also the whole, the, because this was positive, three halves was positive, not negative, is why we did all that. All right, there's that set of the problems. We're still not yet at the two hour mark. Cool. Number 49, of course this says three parts. The path of a diver is modeled by the function there. Let's write it, where f of x is the height of the diver in meters above the water and x is the horizontal distance in meters from the end of the diving board so the plus one probably means we're one meter above the pool i guess what is the height of the dive oh that that answers it what is the height of the diving board part a they don't ask me to explain it but the height of the diving board is one meter now when we say one meter we mean one meter of the above the pool this is because that's the constant, right? That's the y-intercept. When you consider, and I'm sure they're gonna ask us something about a graph later, we can interpret it. When you consider this one, the y-intercept in this upside down facing graph, we're doing something like this, right? We're doing something like that. We're jumping off the diving board, we're going outward. This is actually outwardness, and this is the pool water. So that, that one meter is how that one applies. That's part A. I'll keep that there just in case we have to use it later. Part B. What is the maximum height of the diver? Maximum height is the y value of the vertex. So what we have to do is find, you know, do, we just did maximum a bunch of times. So we got to do it negative b over 2a. The only problem with this is we're going to land on a fraction. Negative b over 2a is negative 9 over negative 18, which is 1 half. That means we go 1 half of a meter outward to reach our maximum height. That's not our maximum height, though. The y value is. So f of 1 half is negative 9 times 1 half squared plus 9 times 1 half plus 1. That's negative 9 fourths plus 9 halves, which becomes positive 9 fourths plus 1. So 9 fourths plus 4 fourths, 1 is 4 fourths, is 13 fourths. Now, because it's a word problem, I'll probably give it its decimal version. That's 3.25. So three, you know, cause that's four and a, it's three and a quarter. So, um, the diver's maximum height is 3.25 meters. And again, this is above the water. Like when we're answering that part, do I, am I supposed to put a space? I think so. 3.25 meters above the water. Part C describe where the diver is ascending and where the diver is descending. So this is about the X value of the vertex, this one half here. So the one half is also 0.5, right? So, and I'll write this in words this time. The diver is ascending, so going up, from the time, is it a she, the he, they? From the time they bounce off the diving board, exit the diving board to 0.5 meters away, and they are descending after 0 0.5 meters away from the diving board, right? So the I the uh, this is where I'm gonna use the graph again. This vertex, and I'll go back down there if you need to write it. But this vertex here is at 0 0.5 comma 3.25. So the 0 0.5 is this guy right here. They're ascending here. They're descending here before. From 0 to 0 0.5 meters, they're ascending. From 0.5 meters onward, they're descending. And that's part C. Okay, let's go to number 50. Problem solving. The engine torque Y in foot-pounds of one model of a car is given by this guy. 
And that's not feet per pound or whatever. It's feet times pounds. Y equals, I'm probably going to use the calculator this time, <laughs> x squared plus 23.2x. All right, where x is the speed and thousands of revolutions per minute of the engine. I'll have to be very careful on units if they do something. Uh, oh, we'll see. Find the engine speed that maximizes torque. What is the maximum torque? So those are both vertex questions, right? They want to figure out those things that do maximum stuff. So part A, we're just, you know, I'm going to work that negative B over 2A stuff. I will use the calculator in some parts. It's all about vertex. So X is negative B over 2A. Yeah, straight to calculator, folks. So this is negative 23.8. 2 divided by 2 times negative 3.75. That's negative 7.5. Negative, oh, uh, well, it's not a clean number. Um, it's around 3.093. The threes end up repeating after that. So I'll just give the approximate. But I'm going to plug in, I'm going to do some rounding in general. And I'm, I'm going to plug in this number though. I got to plug in the number to the equation. So now I got to do, I'm going to make sure I wrote the problem right. Negative B over 2A, I did. All right, now we're going to do negative 3.75 times that number squared plus 23.2 times that number plus 38.8. Then I get around 74.68. So the Y value is about 74.683. And then the six repeats after that. So it's kind of weird numbers with those ones. I'm just going to take them for what they are. I know that's it's got some rounding with it, right? But we'll still kind of take it as it is. Now, keep this in mind. X is represented in thousands of revolutions per minute. They said, what's the engine speed that maximizes torque? That's going to be the X value. So the engine speed is it's the X value. But... That's in thousands. So the engine speed is approximately 3,093. If you multiply by 1,000, it'll be that. And then the threes repeat there. So RPM at maximum torque. The max torque is that next number. And that is in foot pounds. That Why? The maximum torque is about 74.68 foot pounds. Okay. So those are just the rounded values for those as far as writing them. It's kind of strange, but that's, that's how it works. Um, okay, that's part A. Part B. Explain what happens to the engine torque as the speed of the engine increases. Oh, oh as it increases. So because this is a negative function, that is a maximum. By the way, the vertex was only representing a maximum because this was a negative. This is an up, down thing, whatever. So the, the idea is as the speed of the engine increases, well, it increases for so long until it hits, you know, the, the torque at max right there, and then it goes back downward. So I don't know if they're saying to the left and right of that number, this is what it does. I think we're just going to say that. We're going to say the, the um, what do you call it, the torque increases. The torque increases up until it hits this many RPM. So the torque increases until we hit roughly, where's that number, 3093 RPM. And then it decreases as we continue increasing beyond. 3,093 RPM, right? Because that's the idea. That's that maximum. It maxes out there, and then it kind of goes down after that because there is some peak for those. I got to figure out what it is in my car and because I have a manual, so it depends on, you know, what time I want to, you know, what's the ideal shifting point, basically. That's why I want to know for mine. Anyway, I should look that up. All right, in exercises 51 and 52, write an equation for the area of the figure, then determine the maximum possible area of the figure. It's all about maximizing here and it's based off models. You see there are, if you have this fixed perimeter of your figure, if you will, because that's kind of what this is. Even though the width can change, 
Let me kind of copy paste this. Even though the width can change, the length changes based on width, which fixes, I guess, your perimeter in a way. But with a fixed perimeter, your area can change as well. And when your area changes, that means it can get bigger or smaller. What maximizes it? So write an equation for the area of the figure. The area of the figure is length times width. However, or width times length. However, here the length is represented as 20 minus w. So if I distribute this, I get 20w minus w squared. Or should I say negative w squared plus 20w. So there is an expression for area in terms of width. They say determine the maximum possible area of the figure. You maximize your area given a certain width. When can the y be biggest based on this x? You know what I mean? If there's still a parabola for this quadratic, and it's a negative stretch factor. That's why I put it in standard form. So we still want to find the vertex. Vertex, the width that gives you maximum area is at negative b over 2a which is negative 20 over negative 2, or 10. So when your width is 10, they said determine the maximum possible area. That area, given 10, is negative 10 squared plus 20 times 10, which is negative 100 plus 200, which is 100, 100 square units. So. Write an equation for area to determine the maximum possible area. It's 100. Apparently, it's when both the length and width are 10. And that's true. When you have a quadrilateral and you can represent all four sides with variable amounts, uh, squaring off your area as most as possible is where you're maximizing area the most. All right, let's go to number 52. Same question, type, different shape, different uh, parameters. We have a base of B, or whatever you want to call it, and then a 6 minus B to represent, I guess, height. Okay, I hit copy, but it's not, it's not, come on, there it goes. Okay, so for this one, the area of a triangle is 1 half base times height, and these ones seem to be, like, perpendicular. That's a 6, that's a B. So we're going to now get 1 half. Oh, we're going to distribute. So 1 half times 6 is 3. 3 times b is 3b. And this is minus 1 half b squared. Now you want to write this once again with this in standard form, probably to note what your a is and what your b is. Now be careful. When I say b, I mean this b, not this b. So here's your area for this thing in terms of base. Now I want to maximize this stuff based off vertex. Remember, it's a downward facing parabola, so that there is a maximum. The B value that gives you the largest area will be based off this negative B over 2A. Neg 2 times negative 1 half is negative 1. Negative 3 over negative 1 is 3. So a base length of 3, and apparently a height of 3 as well, I guess when this is squared off, it also maximizes the area most. Um, I guess it's going to be 4.5, but let's, let's plug it into here to be sure. Area based off plugging in 3 is negative 1 half times 3 squared plus 3 times 3, that's negative 9 halves plus 9, which is positive 9 halves, or 4.5, 4.5 square units. So that's going to be what maximizes our area, and that is the maximum area in and of itself. So yeah, we can use models with these things as long as they can get a quadratic with it, maximum still based off the peak of the parabola. And in these cases for area, that can still be done, especially when you can express one portion of your thing, like the length or the height, in terms of the other parameter, like the width or the base, respectively. All right, in exercises 53 to 60, we have to graph the function. So more graphing to be had. Label the x-intercepts, vertex, and axis of symmetry. These are in intercept form, or as I call it, factored form. Actually, the last two are vertex form. Eh, you can argue either way, but I like to call this vertex form. So y equals x plus 3 times x minus 3. Now, the first thing I want to bring up are x-intercepts, and this is the only time I'm probably going to do this part, but when you set y equal to 0 are where you cross the x-axis. This is zero product property, which states you can set these two parts equal to 0. So what are the values of x and y equals 0? They're negative 3 and they're 3. Now, normally, I'm going to do this very fast and just go straight to, hey, the x-intercepts are negative 3 and 3 like that. So I'll skip everything in blue. 
you just take the opposites of the values that are there but for reason of zero product property that that happens now it's from here I probably want to start constructing the graph I know that and this is where I'm going to do some trade-offs between what the book would do versus what I would do I'd like to plot these right now because the axis of symmetry is always exactly in between right halfway in between smack dab in the middle of your two x-intercepts now halfway between negative three and positive three is zero that means your axis of symmetry is right there at x equals zero on the y-axis if you weren't sure on that or didn't have a visual or you know something like that you wanted to follow the book you would be averaging these two numbers the x value is you average these by add them and divide by two and zero over two is zero so x equals zero is the axis of symmetry they did say label that that thing so i will at the end and they want the vertex now the vertex is on the axis of symmetry so to find it you're going to have to substitute zero for x to find y so zero plus three times zero minus three that's 3 times negative 3, which is negative 9. So your vertex is at 0, negative 9. And from there, we can do the rest of our graph. So 0, negative 9 is here. We got a stretch factor of 1. You can't see it, but there's a 1 there. And from there, we can complete the rest. So we're going to do the stretch factor of 1 and go 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9 is there. And I'll keep going. 4, 16. Uh, 16 up from 9 is I don't even know why am I having so much trouble with that 7 and 5 25 25 up from 9 is 16 why did I do that so much quicker more quickly quickest -er. all right quickerest that is but one problem yes we got to do our graphs oh and I got to do some labeling now when they say label I did on the side but I guess we're supposed to do it on the graph itself. I don't know that for sure, but I have been, so I'll stay consistent. So these are our x-intercepts. This is our vertex. And here is our axis of symmetry. Label vertex, x-intercepts, axis of symmetry. All right, there's number 53. Number 54. Y equals x plus 1 times x minus 3. Let's go to the next page. All right, this is where I can go a little bit faster on x-intercepts and such. The x-intercepts are at negative 1 and 3. Okay, so that's based off what we were saying before there. Now, maybe you plot them first, maybe not. I will. Let's see if we can recognize the axis of symmetry based off this again. Negative 1 and 3. Halfway between negative 1 and 3, 2 away from there is x equals 1. That'll be the axis of symmetry to use the uh, math version of that part, right? We would say average negative one and three, negative one plus three is two, two divided by two is one. So from there, we substitute one into that equation to find the y value of the vertex, which would be on the axis somewhere. So one plus one times one minus three. Now the vertex ones do something similar to what the, um, sorry, in intercept form, these do something similar to kind of what standard form is doing. Remember when standard form, it's like this is half of this number that adds and goes over. These numbers will always be opposite of each other. 2 times negative 2. You saw the last problem was 3 times negative 3. So for vertex-based things, when you plug in the x value of the vertex, that's going to be happening. Get used to that pattern. If that pattern doesn't happen, we did something wrong. That's why I call it out. So 1, negative 4 is the vertex. You got a stretch factor of 1, so 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9, etc. Now we're doing things based off of... Um, intercept form could we expand it to standard form and reveal the y-intercept and you know stuff like that sure but uh, I don't think I'm going to I, I don't think the book intends on having us do that so you know let's let's not uh, 16 up from negative 4 is 12 there we go oh what's 25 oh, 21 I can't fit that okay so there's that oof could have been better curve. My genuine only concern now is do I finish, can I finish this in time? Will I have enough computer space to finish everything? Sometimes I run out. All right, I got a vertex. I got x-intercepts. I got these things. Here they are. I got the axis of symmetry. Ooh-ah. X-intercepts, vertex, 
axis of symmetry. So I do, I do get these numbers here as well. I hope you recognize that, that I'm writing them all here. All right, number 55. All right, different stretch factor. I hope you noticed that one to begin with there. Now, the x-intercepts will be the opposite of what you see inside there. We're going to get negative 2 and negative 6 by virtue of zero product property. All right, let's plot those ones. Let's get them started. Hope that's enough space. I hope that's not blinding. Let me just scroll down so it doesn't look weird. So negative 2 and negative 6. Halfway between, that's negative 4, yeah? Halfway between negative 2 and negative 6 is a 4, yeah? And then the whole class goes, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. So we got an X. I'm only going to do this a little bit longer. I need to entertain myself in some different ways, yeah? Axis of symmetry, okay? You you average your two sub-values here, divide them by 2, and you get a negative 4, and that seems to agree with it, yeah? Yeah, okay. All right, so <laughs> how to... Had to get myself ugh, up again. All right, so we're gonna do three times negative four plus two times negative four plus six. What did I say about these things in the middle again? They're gonna be opposites of each other. Negative two times positive two. Negative four times three is negative 12. So we got a vertex of negative four, negative 12. We got an axis of symmetry of x equals negative four. Ooh, this goes a little low. It's good I went low. And it's got a stretch factor of 3 with these x-intercepts going through. So over 1 up 3, over 2 up 12, right? So we hit those. And then over 3 up, what's 9 times 3? 27. What's 27 up from negative 12? 15. 15. I can't even get to the y-intercept here without uh, kind of running out of space there. So... Choo. Whew. Oh, yeah. You know what I need to change is the tip on my stylus. It's kind of scratching the tablet surface there. I need to change this thing out. I think that's part of the problem of graphing these is it's a little rough to go down that thing. You should see my tablet board. It's not as smooth as it used to be. It's uh, showing its age now. I've had it for, oh, maybe 10 years. Maybe not 10. Maybe 7. All right, number 56. I've had it for a long time. I've recorded a lot of videos and done a lot. No, it wasn't just videos. Guys, I did distance learning. I did Zoom. I did tutoring this way. This this is this is ran its course. Remember, I've done this for a long time. So this is a this is just this is a tablet that's seen better days. I'd show you, but I don't know if it's gonna show up in the light here. Alright, this is the last problem on this set for which I will calculate the the uh axis of symmetry using the average of the values instead I'll just use the graph the rest of the way I used it for support here on out the only time I may do it other than this is if it lands on a weird fraction or perhaps a fraction that I feel like I want to touch on the fact that we can agree that it lands on that all right otherwise I use the graph five and one halfway between five and one is three right that's what I want to generally tend to use but I've been showing the math leading up to it and this is one problem where I'll still show it one more time Oh, this isn't x equals. This is x intercepts. Give me one second. x intercepts of 5 and 1. All right. Axis of symmetry is at x equals. You average 5 and 1, and you get 3, right? So the same thing. So I'm not going to be writing that step as much. I'll say what axis. Oh, did I label? I'm sorry. Let me label on this past one. I started talking about my um, tablet, my touchpad. Axis of symmetry and vertex. I labeled on that one. Okay, so I have my x-intercepts there. I just got my axis of symmetry, and that one's drawn. Let's get the vertex by plugging in 3. So we're going to get 2 times 3 minus 5 times 3 minus 1. That's negative 8. So we got a vertex of 3, negative 8. Down here, stretch factor of 2, it goes up, 1, 2, 2, 8, already plotted, 3, 18, 18 up from negative 8 is 10, and I'm sure that's the extent to what we can fit, so I'm just going to do that. Okay, um, 
Don't forget to label. Don't forget to label. Don't forget to label. Don't forget to label. Number 57. Oh, don't forget to label. So vertex. Aus. Less x ints. All right. Number 57. All right, for these last four, I'll do, I'll find the axis of symmetry likely as just halfway between the numbers. Um, if you saw what I did on that last problem when I plugged in the x value to find y for the vertex, I didn't truly substitute. I just said 3 minus 5 is this and 3 minus 1. I'm going to continue doing that as well. All right, this one here, keep in mind the... Um, well, a couple things right here. I want to show you this. I could also rewrite this as negative 1 times x minus 0 times x plus 6. I want to bring that up to remind you of what A truly is and what your x-intercepts are. Guys, the x-intercepts here are 0 and negative 6. When you consider, what do you call it, um, zero product property, this times this equals 0, either this equals 0, that equals 0. x equals 0 is one of your zeros. Negative 6 is the other. But x equals 0 is one of your zeros there. And I want to remind you that negative 1 being the stretch factor, vertical stretch factor, is how that other part will play out in a moment. But first, we plot. Halfway between 0 and negative 6 is negative 3. That's it. No more calculation. But I will have to plug in negative 3 into here. g of negative 3 is opposite of negative 3 times, what's negative 3 plus 6? Positive 3. Right? These should be opposites. And that'll give you nine. So you got a vertex of negative three. I forgot what the x was because I didn't write it. I, I still do have to write it even if I don't calculate it. So the axis of symmetry or the vertex is negative three and nine. Axis of symmetry is x equals negative three. I did skip a step. All right. So negative three, nine is up here. We're going downwards with a stretch factor of one or negative one. But one, one, two, four, three, nine. 416, that's 7 down from the x-axis. And 25 down from 9 is negative 16. So that's all the way down here. 5, 25. Paul, plot as many points as I can fit. Aren't you proud of me, Paul? Won't stop. Can't stop, won't stop, Paul. All right. The labeling cometh v, ooh, a little more space, x int and a o s. Hopefully you're good with that labeling. As I've written down what they are here, right? A o s, v, and x int. All right. All right, number 58. Yeah, 58 is a lot like 57, right? Ooh, 58 has one difference we'll talk about. We might have to calculate it. But number 58, we got negative 4x times x plus 7. Once again, as a re-reminder, you can turn, you don't even have to turn x into x minus 0. Just make sure that you know it's not attached to the hip of the negative 4. It is its own part of the product, right? It's its own bit. To get the x-intercept of that, you got to plug in 0 for x, right? It's also the y-intercept of this thing if you distribute this thing out. But x-intercepts are 0 and negative 7. The, um, vertical stretch factor, you know, is four and it flips over. But that's the x-intercept, or those are the x-intercepts of this thing. Whether you write x minus zero or keep it in how it was written to begin with, in intercept form is up to you, but recognizing that is crucial. Now the difference in this problem is what? Between zero and negative seven is a decimal. What's halfway between zero and seven? Well, three and a half. So this is going to be at x equals negative three and a half for this guy. Maybe that one's harder to kind of come up with on your own. Maybe you do want to calculate that one. Axis of symmetry, you average 0 and negative 7. And there's your negative 3.5. So that's your axis of symmetry. X equals negative 3.5, okay? And then we are going to substitute negative 3.5 into here to get the y value. So the y value is negative 4 times negative 3.5 times guess what this will be positive 3.5 negative 3.5 plus 7 positive 3.5 now i know 3.5 squared is 12.25 so negative that times negative 4 is positive 12.25 times 4 is actually a clean number is it 49 i think it's 49 oh well that's a problem for us as well 
So the vertex is going to be at negative 3.5 comma 49. The problem for us is our scaling. If I need to reach 49, these got to go by like 10, 20, 30. Nope. 20, 40. Oof. Even if I do 40. You know what? Let's do that. Let's do these will go by one still. So this is like, you know, five, whatever. But this will be 20, 40, 60, things like that. Here's why this is fine for me, sort of. If these go, because 20 here means these are going by fours, four, eight, 12, etc. But the stretch factor is four. So if the stretch factor is four, now it'll look to me like a one, one, two, four, three, nine thing, because one, one is really one, four, and two, four is really two, 16. I'm really doing that stretch. You can't see it for what it is, but I'm really doing it. So I'm really doing it, pal. So let's let's plot that. So that's, you know, it's at 44, 48, 49, and 48's a quarter, or 49's a quarter up from 48. So that's the 12.25 up. That's where that 12.25 kind of comes into play. Where's 12.25? I meant negative four times negative 12.25. Okay. Anyway. Here I can go over one, down one. The only problem is I'm still kind of on fractions, but over one, down one, over two, down one, two, three, four, like that. Oh, and I'm at half marks. I didn't even realize that. Over three, down nine, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then these ones are at kind of, I won't call them random parts, but it's over three and a half, and then down 49. Over four down, and by the way, when I say down nine, I really mean down 36, right? But the scale is fours. Over four down 16, that was 12 and a half, so 12.25, or 12 shoot. 13, 14, 15, 16. I kind of sputtered out there. I can probably fit a couple more. Over five down 25, what's 25 down from 12 and a half? 12 and a quarter It'd be 12 and three quarters right so 12 and three quarters I think down I guess that's the only other one I can fit I guess that's the last one all right sorry that one took a moment to kind of come up with hopefully you can see those a little trick here a little trick here thanks for all that y'all all right But I did hit those x-intercepts. I shall label them. Okay, here we go. So x-intercepts. The vertex. And the axis of symmetry. All right. Had to change the scaling on that, right? Keep that in mind. This also has that same change scale. Negative 20, negative 40, stuff like that. I don't know what the exact y values were. I counted by multiples of four. All right, 59 and 60 are interesting because they are actually vertex form, but they're also kind of factored form. If you kind of keep in mind the fact, whoops, not 19, 59. If you keep in mind the fact that squaring something means multiplying something by itself. So you can see this in one of two ways. This way, which I prefer to do, or this way where you expand, not expand, but you write out x minus 3 squared as x minus 3 times x minus 3. Now, when you think of the intercepts here, the x-intercepts are x equal, uh, 3, right? 3 and 3. Well, 3 is the only intercept. Now, how can a quadratic a parabola only hit the x-axis once if the vertex is on the x-axis? Because consider this being in vertex form. The vertex of this is at 3, 0, which actually is a good thing because that means I don't have to do extra work to find the vertex or the axis of symmetry. But the x-intercept also being the vertex means that's how it's only going to hit it once. Now remember, axis of symmetry is going to just be at x equals 3 because we're in vertex form technically. But that's the x-intercept. So this is actually going to be a quicker problem for me. This one and, um, let me write this over here, and the uh, next one I think is also in vertex form. So I think these two problems should be quicker, not longer. But I want you to recognize what you're looking at, whether you call it vertex form, whether you call it factored form, or intercept form, and all that. You're seeking those things. So three is here. Now finding extra points for most people would be a different story for mere mortals. For myself and you guys, we know our one, one, two, four, three, nine story, even with the stretch factor of negative 
2, which is what we're going to be going based off of. So negative 2 stretch factor is over 1 down 2 and reflected over 2 down 8 and reflected. And we know that over 3 down 18 is just a shot away from 17, but we can still plot it, and we will. So this graph will look like that there. Curve up and through and to and back down. And we label. And then we'll move on to our last problem of this bit. This is both the vertex and the x-intercept, the one x-intercept, and this is your axis of symmetry. Okay? I feel like I have a bump. Sorry. Let, let bump that. All right. Number 60 is the last one of this set. And then we still have 24 more problems to go. And I probably only have about an hour left of space on my computer to get them all done. So a little more than two minutes of problem. I don't know how they're going to go, especially if we have to graph. Uh, y equals 4 times x minus 7 quantity squared. So this one, again, straight up, what are some things we can call out? Vertex is at 7, 0. Axis of symmetry is at x equals 7. The x-intercept is 7. Straight up, those three things we can actually get right from vertex form, at least given that this vertex is on the x-axis. Because the k is plus 0, right? That's where that happens. So that'll go pretty fast. So 7, 0 is here. Axis of symmetry goes right down through it. And a stretch factor of 4 over 1 up 4 over 2 up 4 times 4, which is 16. So goes pretty fast, goes pretty sharp. Yes, these are the quickest of the problems that we had compared to the uh, earlier problems. Then a couple labeling things, and we'll be, we'll be done. Okay. So there's this one. We got a vertex, and also, oh, by the way, it's the x-intercept. And oh, by the way, they're both on the axis of symmetry. Okay, that's number 60. Let's move on to the next set. Number 61 to 64, identify the x-intercepts of the function and describe where the graph is increasing and decreasing. Use a graphing calculator to verify your answer. I don't know if I plan on using the graphing calculator to verify it. I think I, you know, I've said this before. Look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm the graphing calculator now, right? I think we know what things are going to happen based off this. Uh, assuming we understand what's happening with the problems themselves. It, it, it depends. Maybe the problems will be tricky. So f of x equals 1 half times x minus 2 times x plus 6. Now, they didn't say to graph these equations. So maybe, hmm, let's see. The x-intercepts will be 2 and negative 6. What do they want? Identify the x-intercepts. Boom. They're at 2 and negative 6. Now, if I'm not going to graph, it might be worth me to use the axis of symmetry thing, the feature from before. Axis of symmetry is you average these two numbers. That's negative 4 over 2, which is negative 2. This is where we do the increasing, decreasing stuff, right? That's why I need that number. They say, identify the x-intercepts, describe where it's increasing and decreasing. So this is all I need. I don't need the y value of the vertex. I do need the axis of symmetry, though, to say we are increasing... This is, um, this is an upward facing graph. So here, let me give you a preview of this graph. They said use a graphing calculator. I'm going to use this. Here's 2. Here's negative 6. Here's the axis of symmetry. It's an upward facing graph, so it does something like that, right? I don't know what the vertex is. I just know that that's at negative 2. So we increase here. We decrease here. So we're increasing when x is greater than negative 2, and we're decreasing when x is less than negative 2. Feel free to use a graphing calculator on this, but I'm going to go ahead and state those are the values, and I feel pretty confident in all that. I feel certainly confident in all that. Number 62, once again, that A value means nothing to us other than it being positive or negative, and it's positive. I don't care if it's three-fourths. I don't care if it's a billion. Uh, we're not looking for the Y value of the vertex, and we're not graphing it, really, truly. Uh, so the x-intercepts, just for non-color blindness, I'm going to use blue, are negative 1 and 3. What's, what's halfway between negative 1 and 3? Can you imagine those ones? 1, right? Negative 1 and 3, their distance is 4. 2 away from either is 1. So the axis of symmetry x value is 1, which matters for our increasing, decreasing stuff. We're increasing. It's positive, right? 
So we're increasing when x is greater than 1, and we're decreasing when x is less than 1. So if it feels like I am going faster on them, in some ways I kind of want to because of what we've already done for the problems. I also want to for my own time's sake. I own the right to be selfish when I go probably past three hours on this whole endeavor. Um, but yeah, it's just a matter of what you saw before. And you can use the graphing calculator to confirm this. But I'm using this information to kind of get you to where we are. All right, number 63. And by the way, these are all intercept form. Being factored, we can find those intercepts whip fast. So g of x here, this is negative. Remember that. It's upside down facing. But your x-intercepts are at 4 and 2. Halfway, whoops, halfway between 4 and 2 is 3. So your axis of symmetry is at x equals 3. So to the left and right of 3, we hit the vertex, it peaks. So we're going, we're increasing until we hit 3, and then we decrease after 3, right? So we're increasing when x is less than 3, and we're decreasing when x is greater than 3. This is because this is an upside down facing graph, the negative. Doesn't matter that it's a 4, just matters that it's negative. And then number 64, and again, and I use the graph. I use the graphing calculator in here to confirm it, right? In here, in here. Uh, h of x, I just hope I'm right. h of x is negative 5 times x plus 5 times x plus 1. Now, they were decent enough to give us integer x-intercepts, integer axes of symmetry, things like that. x-intercepts, negative 5, negative 1. Not negative 5 because of this, negative 5 because of that. Halfway between negative 5 and negative 1 is negative 3. That's our axis of symmetry. And this graph also faces downward, which is a maximum. So up until negative 3, we're increasing. After negative 3, we decrease. So we increase when x is less than negative 3. Not equal to. We increase when x is less than negative 3. And we decrease when x is greater than negative 3. Okay, cool, kind of quick. Number 65 and 66 are modeling with mathematics, so let's take a look. A soccer player kicks a ball downfield. The height of the ball increases until it reaches a maximum height of 8 yards, which is 20 yards away from the player. So, ooh, that's probably the way we should have said the shot put in basketball ones. Away from the person. Maybe I did say that. A second kick is modeled by this equation here. Which kick travels farther before hitting the ground? Which kick travels higher? Okay, so let's look at the first one with the 8 yards up and 20 yards over. If I write a vertex form version of that, I'll call this, um, I'll just call it f of x. f of x equals, now as far as vert, so that's a vertex, right? Vertex is at... 820, a height of 8 yards, 20 feet away from the player. My assumption of this is they're kicking it from the ground. They, it wasn't midair when they kicked it, so there's no extra bit that we're going to look at from there. So, before I write the function, I need to do this. Let's visualize the graph. The graph of this thing starts right from the ground. It goes outward, hits this vertex at 820, and goes back down. Now, honestly, I don't know if we actually need a model for this thing, but here's, here's what I can tell you. Eight feet in the air, 20 feet away. When it hits the ground, it'll be 40 yards away. So that might be part of the question that we answered. I still want to write a model for this one. So we'll call this f of x. f of x equals, yeah, I'll just say y equals, y equals. Now for this one here, we don't know a yet. I still don't know if we actually need an a, but this is x I, I'm sorry, I said 820. This is 28. 20, comma, 8. X minus 20, quantity squared, plus 8 in vertex form. Now, we know 0, 0 as an X and Y value for this equation. We can use those to solve for A by substituting 0, 0. If I subtract 8 over and square negative 20, I can divide by 400 and I'll get negative 8 over 400. If you've seen things like this, you know what I'm talking about as far as that. That reduces, they can both divide by 8, right? Negative 1 over 50 or negative um, 0 0.02, negative 0 0.02. So I can say y equals negative 0 0.02 
times x minus 20 quantity squared plus 8. Anyway, there's one version of that equation. I don't know if I need that stuff. I just wanted to call attention to it. It's there. Maybe I did more than I needed to. Which kick travels farther before hitting the ground? Which kick travels higher? Yeah, honestly, I didn't need this information. I, I just wanted to spew it out. I got it. Anyway, there's another there's another equation here that's this model y equals x times 0.4 minus 0.008x now i imagine they probably want you to use a calculator for this i want to go a little bit differently with it i'm seeing here a gcf of some sort i want this x to be one so i actually want to fa factor out a negative 0.008 from this now there's the x right here that still sits there right this x is still here in this part of the equation I wanted to factor this out from the x to get x, and I want to factor out negative 0.008 from 0.4. Now, 0.4 divided by negative 0.008, I think it's like 220, uh, negative 0.008 is, oh, negative 50. Really? All right. Uh, minus 50. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So, okay, this is factored form of this thing, by the way. When, when it comes to factored form, what you're looking at two things. You're looking at an x-intercept of 0 and an x-intercept of 50. 50 means that's as far as it travels, right? When it comes to this graph here, it hits the, it's 0 and 50. It went up somewhere. We didn't figure that out, but it also hits 50 right here. We don't yet know where it hit up here. That's where we have to find the vertex by plugging in the axis of symmetry. Axis of symmetry is halfway between 0 and 50, which is 25. So we got to substitute 25 into that equation. So negative 0.008 times 25 times negative 25. So let's do that one. Here we're going to get 5. So y equals 5. That means we get a vertex of 25 comma 5. So listen. I don't think doing what I did here was important for the problem. I think that just visualizing this graph was all that I needed. How high does it go? Eight feet. They told us that. But how far does it go? 40 feet. So there are two different soccer balls that are kicked. The first one, they say the first kick, right? Or they say a second kick later. The first kick traveled higher, but the second kick traveled farther. The first kick traveled higher at eight feet versus the second kicks five feet but the second kick traveled farther at 50 feet versus the first kicks 40 feet right that was the difference between the two I think this was incredibly necessary for us to do if we weren't using a calculator, so I'm glad we were able to do that. This first part, eh, I didn't actually use that model. Apologies for jumping into that part. Good extra instruction if you're doing the problem with me. All right, let's jump to number 66. Although a football appears to be flat, what? Some are actually shaped like a parabola. Oh, a football field. That's so Although a football field appears to be flat, some are actually shaped like a parabola, so the rain runs off to both sides. Oh, they're talking about the actual, not from the top down. If you're looking on the side, you can see water runoff, right? A little curvature. The cross, yeah, not drawn to scale down there. The cross section of a field can be modeled by that equation. Definitely going to use a calculator as needed. Negative point zero zero zero. It's basically not that curved. It's slightly curved. Where X and Y are measured in feet, what is the width of the field? What is the maximum height of the surface of the field? I don't know if a field is actually 50, 50 yards in width or something. I, I don't know. Well, actually, we should know from this <laughs> here in a second. Uh, remember, X is just another quantity here, like X minus 0. So you have X intercepts. You have X intercepts of 0 and 160. So axis of symmetry is halfway between 0 and 160, which is 80. So the football field's width, actually, we don't need the 80 for the width. Football field's width is 160 yards. Oh, feet. 
feet. I was going to say 160 yards. 100 yards is the length of it, or 120 if you consider the end zone. Okay, 160 feet, which is about 53 and a third yards. So I was close in saying 50 yards. Uh, okay, so we still need the 80, though, because we have to now find the height of it. The maximum height is based on plugging 80 into here. Now, I'm going to be doing... I'll just put y equals and I'm going to type it in the calculator. So I got negative 0.000234 times 80 times, well, negative 80. Uh, 80 minus 160. And I get 1.4976. I don't dare to round that unless they ask me to. That's exact. 1.4976. And this is in feet. So the football field, the football field, is 160 feet in width. That's just the difference between your two x-intercepts. And the maximum height of the surface of the field is 1.4976 feet. That's kind of a little tall, right? One and a half feet compared to its size. It's 18 inches. That's, that's significant. I don't know if that's true, how that works. All right. Number 67 is open-ended, so it's up to you, it's up to me. Write two different quadratic functions in intercept form whose graphs have the axis of symmetry at x equals 3. Fair enough. So what you have to do is just make sure that your x-intercepts are the same distance away. So if I do one that's like, wait, x equals 3. If I do one that's like, all right, here's 3, here's 3. I'll do one that's negative, one that's positive. Let's get one to go four away from three here and here. That's at seven and negative one. And let's get one that goes one away from three and it goes upward and that's at two and four. So <clears throat> this one would have to be, it doesn't matter what the stretch factor is. So this one can be Y equals, let's say negative two times X plus one times X minus seven. That'll have an axis of symmetry at X equals three. And this one here can be y equals, let's say, 3 halves times x minus 2 times x minus 4. So as long as they're the same distance away, right, that's the idea of it. And that's why the visual of the graph there is pretty nice to have. There's open-ended. Got it. Number 68, using structure. Write the quadratic function f of x equals x squared plus x minus 12 in intercept form. Graph the function, label the x-intercepts, y-intercept, vertex, and axis of symmetry. Uh, that one's kind of tricky because it's not actually factorable. When they say intercept form, they mean make sure you have the factorization of it. The thing about it, though, is... Oh, that's factorable. I don't know why I said that. All right, so this factors into... I was thinking of something else. This factors into x plus 4 times x minus 3. You want to find two numbers that multiply to negative 12 and add to 1. There they are, right? So there's the intercept form. I'll call it factored form. That's me. Factored form... All right, graph the function, label the x-intercepts, y-intercept, vertex, and axis of symmetry. Ooh, there's still more to go. All right, well, I'll tell you what. This is the y-intercept right here. That'll be part of the graph. The x-intercepts we know will be at negative 4 and 3. We got to find half the distance in between, and I'll use the calculation for that for axis of symmetry. That's negative 4 plus 3 over 2, which is negative 1 half, or negative 0.5. We still have to find the vertex by plugging in negative one half into either factored form or standard form. I'll choose factored form here. The f of negative one half is, I'll put negative 0.5, negative 0.5 plus 4 times negative 0.5 minus 3. That's 3.5 times negative 3.5, which is negative 12.25. So your vertex is at negative 0.5 comma negative 12.25. So I think we have everything we need. We have axis of symmetry, we have x-intercepts, we have y-intercept, we have vertex. I might have said that already. Yep, we need those four things. Now we just need to graph it. And we have a stretch factor of one. hey -o. So, we're barely gonna squeeze it in. Okay, so, we're at Hmm. Negative 4, 3, negative 0.5, negative 12.25. Oh, 12.25, that's a quarter from there. 
stretch factor is one. Oh, uh, y intercept of negative 12 right there. It's, that's the uh, reflective points over there. We can tell because this axis of symmetry that's right there, close enough to it, right there. And then I'm gonna work on my stretch factor of one, one. Oh boy, these are mean. Two, four. Three, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Some rando points as intercepts. Four, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I'm just gonna count up like that. And I'm probably gonna only fit one more set of points. Five, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Right there. All right, so I have points for my graph. Sketch my, 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 my graph. I don't know why I thought this wasn't factorable. I said, if it's not factorable, we're gonna have to solve using quadratic formula and blah, blah, blah. But no, the troublesome part wasn't the factoring. It was everything else, everything else. All right, let's do some labeling. First of all, axis of symmetry. I'll put that up top. All right, x-intercepts are here. The y-intercept is just this one right there. It's not the vertex. The vertex is right next to it, right there. Okay, and that is the graph. All right, number 69. We are at almost three hours here. Maybe pressing for time. 16 problems to go. 69 to 72, use completing, the, oh yeah, use completing the square to find the vertex. It was so long ago that we spoke about this. Use completing the square to find the vertex of the parabola or the center and radius of the circle, then graph the equation. So number 69, it looks like we have what's a parabola because we don't have a y squared and only an x squared. We're going to get y by itself. I'm just gonna add y to this side, make it y equals. I still have three x squared plus six x minus two. Now, what I'm gonna do is complete the square with the first two terms only, meaning I'm going to factor three out of these first two terms. I'm gonna leave the negative two off to the side and I'm going to be adding something in here to complete the square. I'm gonna subtract three times that thing out here because I'm on the same side of the equation. Two divided by two is one, one squared is one. Unfortunately, guys, I, I stated this before, I'm not reteaching how to complete the square. I'm just gonna use that process. So if you need some more work on that, it's something you can do. And the book's gonna do one thing slightly different. They'll put the plus two on this side until they're done with it, then they'll subtract it over. So uh, anyway, this factors down to x plus one quantity squared and negative two minus three is negative five. So there is the graph in vertex form. That's what they wanted. Use completing the square to find the vertex. So the vertex is going to be at negative one, negative five. Now this, this is standard form right here, by the way. This is standard form. This is vertex form. Standard form does give me the y-intercept if you wanted it, but the vertex here at negative one, negative five is the true uh, hero, the true MVP. It's the true MVP of this thing. So I have, even though I have negative two, negative two is a y-intercept, negative one, negative five is the vertex. It also makes axis of symmetry. I'm not going to draw axis of symmetry if I don't feel like I have to, but this point does reflect across the stretch factor is three, so one, three does apply. Two, 12 is next. 12 up from negative five is seven. Uh, three, 18. 18 up from negative five is 13. Wait, three, I'm sorry, it's 327. 27 up, okay, that won't fit. 27 won't fit, so I'm going to Go right there. Sorry, yeah, nine times three, not nine times two. Okay, let's see if we did everything we we're supposed to. Use completing the square to find the vertex, then graph, yes, okay. Here is the vertex, by the way. All right, let's go to number 70. By the way, if I have to do a circle, which I will, on I think 71 and 72, if I have to use a circle or do a circle, I'm going to do the other graph, the squared up one with the scales, just so you know. So I'll attach both of them. So I have negative 2x squared plus 6x minus 2y minus 1 equals 0. Uh, once again, there's no y squared, so I'm just going to add this 2y over to this side, and I got negative 2x squared plus 6x minus 1. 
Now, before I complete the square, it's, it's your choice. I'm going to divide by two now. I don't know if that's better or worse. Mm, I don't know if it's better or worse. I'm going to divide by two now. Just get this in standard form. I get negative one X squared plus three X, but this is minus one half now, whatever. Uh, I still got to complete the square though, which means I still have to factor this negative out, not from all three terms, just from these two terms. Now, dividing by two isn't what's going to cause this little issue right here with the fraction, but in completing the square, I'm, I am going to get a fraction. I have the minus one half and I'm going to subtract negative one times whatever goes here. And I say negative one because this is treated like a negative one. Now, negative three divided by two is negative three halves. Negative three halves squared is nine fourths. So this is nine fourths. This is nine fourths. Oh, yeah. This, yep, yeah, this is nine fourths right there. So this is y equals, I have to graph this after. This is x minus three halves squared. If you know something on completing the square, that's the little trick. Uh, this is, I need a common denominator. So I'm going to call this um, negative two fourths. And here I have to add nine fourths, which is going to become seven fourths. So y is negative x minus three halves squared plus seven fourths. And see, dividing by two would have had to have been had later at this stage anyway. So there's the vertex form. Your vertex itself is at three halves comma seven fourths. By the way, that's also uh, 1.5 comma 1.75, whether you write it like this or like that. I will do graphing down below. The y-intercept is negative one half as well. And the stretch factor is negative one. So this graph will go downward. So I got negative, or I got 1.5 comma 1.75 right here. Not very fun. Y-intercept is negative one half. Oh, that's negative one. Is negative one half. So if I flip this thing over, that's one and a half away and one and a half away right there. That'll also be at negative one half. So let's go over one down. What was it? Negative one? Over one down one like that over two down one two three four over three down nine what's nine minus one point seven five seven point two five so seven point two five and over four down sixteen what's sixteen minus one point seven five hold on I'm running out of kind of space here sixteen minus one point seven five is something um, 14.25. So 14.25 right there. Okay. Lots of, lots of weird, weird graphs. Wouldn't be so bad if there were only a couple of them, like just this one and the whole problem set would have been fine, but there are 84 problems and you got a couple of these going on. It's kind of, it's a lot y'all pushing three hours here. All right. There's the vertex. There's the graph. I think everything agreed with it. I'm going to move forward to the next set. We got number 71, which is a circle because both X and Y are squared. Now we'll complete the square for anything that needs square completing. And we're going to write it in standard equation of a circle, something you would have learned in IM2 or from this section. Now, part of this is this X squared doesn't have any X terms with it. That means this is already a perfect square in and of itself. The Y squared plus 12 Y is where we need to complete the square. 12y plus blank. I don't want the negative 13 on this side. Let's have it add it over and make it a 13. And whatever I complete the square with here, I'm going to add over here. 12 divided by 2 is 6. 6 squared is 36. So that completes the square. So 36 gets added over here. x squared stands on its own. This factors to y plus 6 quantity squared. And 13 plus 36 is 49. This means we have a center. This is a circle. We have a center at 0, negative 6. x is, you know, portion is 0. That's opposite, negative 6. The radius is square root of 49, which is 7. So we're going to graph this. Um, this will go a little out of range of even my squared off graph. I stated I would use it. Now I'm not so sure, but I guess I'll use it anyway. So I'm going to use this one. Sorry, this is going to go a little bit off the uh, off the range here because the radius is seven. I have to go seven away from negative six, and that will leave me at some thirteens. Um, so zero, negative six. You know what? Let's use the tall graph. Sorry about this. 
I can fit it on the tall one. Okay. Sorry about that. So in still using the tall graph, maybe I won't attach the other one. So I got zero negative six as my center. My radius is seven. I can go up seven, right seven, left seven, and down seven. And this is where I can fit my negative 13, boom, like that. And I can draw the best circle I possibly can. Now I'm gonna pretend like I'm doing a really good circle like this. It's actually not terrible, but whatever. Uh, I'm just gonna use the circle tool, but that's what you can ideally do, right? You can draw your best possible circle in doing that. I'm just going to go like that, give myself a really decent looking circle and get rid of the other one. Well, something went wrong here. Um, something did go wrong. Negative six, seven, seven. Maybe this isn't, to maybe the graph axes aren't to scale. So maybe I do have to kind of make shift and pretend like it's a real circle. I don't think the graph axes are perfectly to scale, guys. So, oh well. Okay, pretend like that's a perfect circle. Okay, so there's that. Did I count anything wrong? Seven over. I think that's seven over. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. The graph axes must be bad, y'all. So maybe I do have to use the other one on the next problem. As long as it fits. If it fits, I'll use the other one. Number 72. I didn't actually know that that looked off like that. I never even noticed. 4x squared plus 4y squared minus 24x minus 24y minus 9 equals 0. All right. There are x's on both them, or there are four. There are, each, each variable has a complete and square to do. So 4x squared minus 24x, let's put those together, plus 4y squared minus 24y and it equals 9. Add that over on that side. Now, I want to factor 4's out of each individual thing right here. x squared minus 6x plus blank. And then here, factor the 4 out as well. y squared minus 6y plus blank equals... Now 9 is going to add these two blanks. However, these blanks will also have 4's multiplied by them. 4 times this, 4 times that. It's the same number twice though. 6 divided by 2, negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3, squared is 9, and this one's also 9, and this is 4 times 9, and 4 times 9. So a lot being had there. So this factors down to 4 times x minus 3 quantity squared, plus 4 times y minus 3 quantity squared equals, this is 9 plus 36 plus 36. So 72 plus 9 is 81. Now I have to divide these by 4, by 4, 4, and 4 to get the true nature of a circle. So this will be x minus 3 quantity squared plus y minus 3 quantity squared equals 81 over 4. That means I have a center at 3, 3, but the radius is the square root of 81 over 4, which is 9 over 2. That's 4 and a half. I think this will fit on a standard graph on the like normal shaped one. So I'm just going to use that one because I think it has better scaling than the other one. More squared off, it has my numbers, things like that. Did it not copy? Hello. Copy. Register, please. And paste. There it is. Okay. So let's give this one a shot. I guess I will attach this graph paper for one problem. I don't know if you'll print it out for one or two problems. Maybe we'll have more. So 3, 3 is my center. Now I'm going to go 4 and a half each direction. 1, 2, 3, 4 and a half. This actually does look more squared off, assuming the other ones are wrong. I don't know if it's perfectly squared off, but that's where I can now draw my best looking circle. Okay, there is that one. All right, let's keep moving forward. Number 73. Using structure, recall that the standard equation of a parabola that opens right or left with vertex at hk is this. I do recall that. I don't quite use it. I use this, but I don't quite write it that way. I turn, I still have an a there. So hold on, 73. I say x equals a times y minus k quantity squared plus h noting that a is 1 over 4p. So I'm going to kind of put that off to the side over there. Okay, anyway, use completing the square to find the focus, directrix, and vertex of this equation, then graph the equation. So I'm not going to go deep into teaching it. This is a problem I think I'm just going to do. 
if that's okay. So I got y squared minus 4x minus 8y plus 20 equals 0. Now we got to get x by itself this time. So I'm going to add 4x to this side of the equation. And now I still have that y squared minus 8y plus 20. But let's start completing the square. I know the 4, this time I'm not going to divide by 4 first. Let's do the completing the square here. Let's add something there just to subtract it out. Negative 8 divided by 2 is negative 4. Squared is 16. Add and subtract 16 there. So now, now we got 4x equals y minus 4 quantity squared plus 4. And now we get to divide everything by 4. So divide this by 4 is times 1 fourth here and divided by 4 there. So this will be written as x equals 1 fourth times y minus 4 quantity squared plus 1. All right, that's the vertex form of this guy. And this is a rightward facing parabola because it's an x equals positive y squared equation. Now, as far as a, a is 1 fourth. So a equals 1 over 4p, or p is 1 over 4a, either way you want to put it. Cross multiply, 4p is 4 and p is 1. p is the distance from your vertex to your focus and distance from vertex to directrix. So did they say graph it? Yes. So when it comes to graphing, and I'm going to graph to get the focus and directrix values, the vertex, by the way, is at hk. h is 1, k is 4. So vertex is at 1, 4. All right. I'm going to start there. This has a 1 fourth stretch factor, but it, 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 or compression factor, but it goes this way. Up 1 over 1 fourth of 1, up 2 over a fourth of 4, up 3 over a quarter of 9, up 4 over a quarter of 16, and we reflect across this way in that same way as we would before. We can keep going. Up 5 over a quarter of 25. It's probably all we can fit. What's a quarter of uh, 9? Yeah, up 6 over a quarter of 36 is 9. OK, so we got all these points here. We have our graph. Now the focus is inside of the parabola, meaning to the right. We would add 1 to whatever our vertex is on the x value in this case. So the focus is going to be 1 away, p units away right there. Directrix is going to be 1 unit away right here as a vertical line. Again, I'm not going to really reteach those right now. I'm just kind of bringing those up. So the focus is at 2, 4, and the directrix is at x equals 0. So there's the ver vertex, focus, and directrix. We needed to find those and graph the equation. Boom. There they are. All right, let's go to number 74. Let's see how much space I have left here. Let's see if I'm sweating bullets. Maybe a little. Maybe a little. Depends on how long these problems will be. Consider an equation of the form ax squared plus by plus a da, 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 equals zero. What must be true about the coefficients a and b for the graph of the equation be a parabola, a circle? Explain your reasoning. So the thing about these is to be a parabola, and I don't know if they mean sideways facing versus other. It's okay. For a parabola, if a doesn't equal zero, let me find that symbol. If a doesn't equal 0, then b would have to be 0. And if b doesn't equal 0, then a would have to equal 0. Basically, one of them has to be 0 to wipe out the other. You can only have an x that's squared or a y that's squared. It can't be both. Okay, that's just basically the idea. For it. it says explain your reasoning, because that's the thing. Only one squared variable can exist. Variable can and must exist for a parabola. Now, for a circle, A has to equal B, which cannot equal 0. This is because they need to have... I don't know, you saw in that one problem with those 4s, they need to be the same. They need to have a radius, which will only occur if both are the same and both need to be squared both both squared variables need to exist basically both squared variables need to exist so that's kind of how i'm going to say that one all right number 75 on problem solving an online music store sells about 4,000 songs each day when it charges one dollar per song for each five 
dollar five cent increase in price about 80 fewer songs per day are sold use the verbal model and quadratic function to determine how much the store should charge per song to maximize daily revenue all right well they give us the model so that's good to work off of there let's see what we want to do here so number 75 they have revenue in dollars r sub x and we want to maximize that so we have one plus 0.05 x times 4,000 minus 80 x so we have options we can either write this in standard form and use negative b over 2a or factor out some values and get it in vertex form and blah 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 or uh fact keep keep it in fact get a factored form out from that meaning if i factor 0.05 out from this guy i'll have x plus what's one divided by 0.05 20 200 what is it one divided by point oh, i think it's 20 20 so x plus 20 times and if i factor a negative 80 out from here i'll get x i think minus 5. now 80 negative 80 times 0.05 6 16 4 oh duh so those two become negative 4 and now i have x plus 20 times x minus 5. so this is a factored form version of that thing and we want to maximize daily revenue so we can work off that for it because these are x intercepts of this thing x intercepts are 20 or negative 20 i should say and five something seems wrong about that because that would be a negative negative number how much the store should charge per song I'm gonna make sure those numbers. Oh, that's four thousand, not four hundred. Oh, it's four thousand. So this is fifty. That's fifty. Okay, that is that works a lot better. All right, x-intercepts are negative twenty and fifty. Halfway between negative twenty and fifty, I think is fifteen. Let's try that. Axis of symmetry is at x equals negative twenty plus fifty over two, which is thirty over two, which is fifteen. So. How much should the store charge to maximize daily revenue? $15. That's the that's not the maximum, that's what gets you the maximum. The store should charge $15 per song? That doesn't make any sense. Or well, uh, maybe it does. Um let me let me just pause one sec cuz I want to maximize computer space here as well. Hold on. Okay, I think I've made enough room on my computer to go till four hours if I had to, I think. I think I'm good. All right, this part. $15 sounds a little outlandish. So as I was moving some things over, I the, all my calculations are fine. It's just I'm not done. When you look at the thing, look at the verbal model. Prices, a price in dollars per song. So how many dollars per song? We still have to plug 15 into there. So I'm not done with my answer at that stage. So let me get that out of the way I'll get ready for that I'm gonna turn a 15 into something else I didn't calculate it yet but not revenue just 1 plus 0 0.05 times 15 I still don't know what the 15 really represents or what X represents here it's some arbitrary value to me which works off this model um, 15 times point five times 15 is 75 so 0 0.05 so I think it's 0 0.75 so 1.75 so it's 1.75 dollars per song so the store should charge, so it's not just X that maximizes Y, that X maximizes revenue, but they should charge $1.75 per song to maximize revenue. See, what's gonna happen here is that $1.75 multiplies by the number of sales they get here. They get the right price point and the number of sales to get that maximum, right? It's not the maximum dollars, but it's the maximum revenue. All right, let's go to number 76. And by the way, I did this problem using factored form right here. I'm at factored form. What I could have done was I could have foiled everything out, got it into standard form, used negative B over 2A to get that same X value of 15. I didn't. It was a time sake thing. Now I think I'm just moving on. <laughs> I, I still want to make sure I still fit it within that time slot here. It's been a long time I've been doing this teaching. Number 76. Because once again, I hit these back end problems and I always ask myself, who's listening at this time? I'm okay to do it. I'm just wondering, who's listening at this time? Which teacher assigned these problems? Which college professors like, hmm, let's explore these. Or econ professor, and am I doing it right? 
sometimes not really. Drawing conclusions. Compare the graphs of the three quadratic functions. What do you notice? Rewrite the functions f and g in standard form to justify your answer. I'm going to guess they're all the same. Uh, if they're going to say that, they say compare the graphs of the three. So I guess I got to graph. I guess I got to graph them. F of x equals x plus three times x plus one. I guess it's not enough to just you know. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what though, guys. I'm going to use the other uh, the squared off graphs. I'm not going to go big on it. So x intercept here is our x intercepts are negative three and negative one. So if I go to that graph, I'm going to do this one in. Come on, I'm going to do this one in. Um, blue of course they're all going to go over each other if they're all the same but I'll do this one in blue so negative 3 negative 1 you have an axis of symmetry right in between right at x equals negative 2 so f of negative 2 will give me my vertex that's negative 2 plus 3 which is 1 times negative 2 plus 1 which is negative 1 that's negative 1 so your vertex is at negative 2, negative 1, right there. Stretch factor is 1, so I go 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9. Isn't it apparent? Do you guys notice this as well? Do you guys notice that this is that this looks wider now than the other ones? The other ones do look taller. I guess those other graph axes are too tall. That, that must be the case, and I apologize. I must have to change that scale somehow. Anywho, there's that graph. I'm only going to fit that many. So there's f of x. Let's go to g of x. g of x is x plus 2 quantity squared minus 1. Well, this one's got a vertex of negative 2, negative 1. And, oh, hey, look at that. It's right there. And then all the same things. So, da 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 uh, Stretch factor is still 1, right? Still the same a value. h of x, h of x, this standard form, net x squared plus 4x plus 3, it's got a y-intercept of 0, 3. Let's see this one in purple. It's got a y-intercept of 0, 3. So right, oh look, it's right there. Hey, look at that. And the x value of the vertex is at negative b over 2a, which is negative 4 over 2, which is negative 2. Now if I substitute that into my equation, I get negative 2 quantity squared plus 4 times negative 2 plus 3, which is 4 minus 8 plus 3. 4 minus 8 negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. The vertex is at negative 2, negative 1. Oh, hey, look at that right there. And da 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 So what's our conclusion about all those? They are the same. f of x, g of x, and h of x are the same function. Now they said rewrite the functions f and g in standard form to justify your answer. So they're not asking us to complete the square from standard form or factor from standard form. They're saying expand the other two out. So let's look at f of x one more time here. We have x plus 3 times x plus 1. Let's go ahead and foil this thing. I normally don't write the in-between step here, but x squared plus 1x plus 3x plus 3 becomes x squared plus 4x plus 3. So that does seem to confirm that it's the same as h of x check and then g of x is x plus 2 quantity squared minus 1 which this part expands out to x squared plus 4x plus 4 that's how a perfect square trinomial thing works and 4 minus 1 is 3 so you get x squared plus 4x plus 3 which is once the same once again the same thing as h of x check that justifies it they're all the same okay Number 77, problem solving. A woodland jumping mouse, oh, oh, a woodland jumping mouse hops along a parabolic path given by y equals negative 0.2x squared plus 1.3x, where x is the mouse's horizontal distance traveled in feet and y is the corresponding height distance. It might be traveling pretty far here. It's a pretty freaky mouse. Can the mouse jump over a fence that is three feet high? Justify your answer. So, we're concerned about whether we can eclipse three feet. I don't know if meeting three feet will be fine. I guess we'll say yes, but we want to try and see if we're greater than, greater than or equal to three feet for our vertex. Mm. So the horizontal distance doesn't really matter to us. So what we're gonna do on this, we got y equals negative 0.2x squared plus 1.3x. 
our vertex x value, even still, will be negative b over 2a. Um, I don't want to mess that up. Three point two five. So three point two five. That's not the that that's the horizontal distance. We have to find the vertical. We have to now plug in three point two five into here. So for y, we're gonna do negative point two. I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna say it's gonna crash into the fence, but I have no idea. Three point two five squared plus one point three times three point two five. All right, let's figure out how this one goes. So negative point two times that squared plus one. We're getting 2.1125. So that's the maximum height. So can the mouse jump over a fence that's three feet high? Nope. The cat's going to get him. Uh, the maximum height the mouse can jump, which that's that's high, dude. That's two plus feet. Is that? Yeah, it's in feet. The mouse can jump. Jump is 2.1125 feet which means the mouse cannot jump over a fence that is three feet high. Maybe it can climb. It can skirmish. It can use its might and adrenaline and will, but uh, not based on the model. All right, number 78, how do you see it? Ooh, I used up all my binder paper. Give me a second, let me make more binder paper. Right, guys, I have a few firsts here, man. Never thought I'd see the day that I used that much binder paper. Anyway, this is definitely one of the longer, I think the longest section long video we've had. We're still not done. All right, number whoops, 78. How do you see it? Consider the graph of the function f of x equals a times x minus p times x minus q. All right, looks like that. And that's factored or intercept form. What does f of p plus q over 2 represent in the graph? Okay. So part A, what we're looking at there, first of all, the P plus Q over two is what we would do. P, P and Q represent your x-intercept. So P plus Q over two finds your axis of symmetry value on x when you average those. When you do F of that x, you're finding the y value of the vertex. So F of P plus Q over two, it, I, I don't, I can't really type it out, but so it represents the y value of the vertex. Basically, that's it. Maybe the min or the max. Based on this one, it would be the minimum. If the graph is truly facing upward, graph faces upward, it is also the minimum. If it faces downward, it's the maximum. But I'm just going based off what I'm looking at on that graph. If A is less... Oh, no. Oh, well, okay. I, I will leave this part out because it looks like part B is answering that. So part B, if A is less than zero, how does your answer in part A change? Explain. Oh, okay, then I'll, st I'll still keep that up. So now we'll say if A is less than zero, then the graph faces downward. That point is still a maximum. That Y value is, sorry, is still for the vertex, but now it represents a maximum instead of a minimum. So that's the thing. Right, you're plugging that number in for x to get the value for y for your vertex, but it's a min or a max based on whether your graph faces upward or downward. If it faces downward, it's now a maximum. So that's that's how I see it. That's how I see it. All right, number 79. Modeling with mathematics. The Gateshead Millennium Bridge, never heard of it, spans the River Tyne. The arch, I don't even know where it is. The arch of the bridge can be modeled by a parabola. I think they're talking about that. The arch reaches a maximum height of 50 feet, of uh, 50 meters at a point roughly 60 meters, 63, geez, 63 meters across the river. Graph the curve of the arch. What are the domain or range? What do they represent in the situation? Okay. What I don't know is whether they're talking about whether it's above the river or not. I don't think so. I think they're just saying arch on the bridge. The arch of the bridge can be modeled by a parabola. The arch reaches a maximum height of 50 meters at a point roughly 63 meters across the river. So I don't know if they're talking about here's the river, here's the bridge, here's the arch, and here's 50 meters, or if they're talking about here's the 
arch, here's the bridge, the river is down below, and this here is 50 meters. I If it's 50 meters from the bridge road, that's a pretty tall arch. I, 50 meters is more than 150 feet. I don't even know if the Golden Gate Bridge does something 150 feet tall. Maybe it does. I have no idea. But um, that's relatively tall. I... I'm just trying to look at the image and determine for myself, hmm, which one is it? Hmm. I'm going to guess, because they're not talking about over the river, I'm going to guess it's the second one. So I'm going to go based off that. I'm just going to say, like, all right, we're doing 50, feet meters, 50 meters here. They did say 63 feet, 63 meters across the river. So 63 to cross the river is the max height. There's the 63, and here's 50 meters up that way. That means we're hitting a top 63 across 50 meters up like that. Graph the curve. Okay, I did a very rough sketch one. Sorry about that. But graph the curve. What are the domain and range? What do they represent in the situation? Now, if that goes 63 here, there's another 63 that we can hit going that way. Like that. And I guess that makes sense because otherwise we wouldn't know anything about the arch. But um, 63 meters going that way, that means, whoops, that means that's 126. So 126 meters in total because that's 63 plus 63. Sorry that the graph is very rough. I was trying to first figure out which one it was. I landed on this and I'm good. So the domain in this situation goes from zero meters to 126 meters on X. That's how far the, that's how long the bridge is. The range goes from zero meters to 50 meters on Y. That represents how tall the arch, how much the arch goes in height above the bridge. So the domain represents the length of the bridge well, really of the arch on the bridge. The range represents the heights of the arch above the bridge, right? So I, not just the height, because 50 is the height, but it's all the different parts of the height that's also hit on that, basically. Okay, number 80, thought provoking. You have 100 feet of fencing to enclose a rectangular garden. Whoops, I don't want to put 100 there. I want to put 80 there. Draw three possible designs for the garden. Of these, which has the greatest area? Make a conjecture about the dimensions of the rectangular garden with the greatest possible answer. Uh, area, explain your reasoning. I kind of stated the area answer before. The squarer your rectangle is, the more area there would be. So if that kind of answers that. So anyway, I'll have three options. One of them will be gasp 25 what just happened? I was trying to make a square. We'll be 25 feet on each side. So we'll have one that's 25, 25. Hmm, I wonder what's going to happen in this area compared to the other ones. Another one will be, let's make some up. Um, oops, a little less thick, how about? Let's do 40 and 10. 40 feet by 10 feet, which means that'll, you know, that'll add to 100, right? And the last one, we'll do somewhere in between. Let's do um, in between, sure. Let's do what, 30, 30 and 20? 30 and 20, 30 feet, 20 feet. Okay, so draw three possible designs of these which have the greatest area. So this area is 25 times 25, so 625 square feet. This is 40 times 10 which is 400 square feet. And this one is 30 times 20, which is 600 square feet. Okay, as you notice, the squarer it gets with the, given the same perimeter, given the same perimeter, conjecture, which is true, the squarer your rectangle gets, and by that I mean where width and length become more the same, your rectangle gets, the larger area you'll have for the same perimeter, for a fixed perimeter. So if your rectangle is a square, that's maximizing your area. You can kind of find those things algebraically too if you need to. All right, let's go to number 81. We have four more problems. Number 81, making an argument. 
The point 0.15 lies on the graph of a quadratic function with axis of symmetry x equals negative 1. Your friend says the vertex could be the point 0, 0.05. Is your friend correct? Explain. No. There are two reasons it can't be. Uh, our friend's been wrong a lot lately, guys. Our friend isn't right anymore. Uh, my friend is incorrect. There are two reasons my friend is incorrect. For one, the vertex must be on the same x value as the axis of symmetry. Same x value as the, wait, vertex must be the same as the axis of symmetry, which is, in this case, is x equals negative 1. So at 0, comma 5, no. For another, oh, never mind. I was going to state something else. Never mind. That's the reason. That's the reason. I thought there was another point that was on this graph that was already at x equals 0. And I was going to say that it wouldn't be a function anymore. But 1, 5 is on there. The axis of symmetry says a vertex could be the point. No. No. I don't even know what the 1, 5 has to do with it. But anyway, I'll just move forward. Unless I'm missing something on the problem, that's all I got. Number 82. Wait, wait, hold on. I don't see how much time I have left within this stuff. And like, did I... Did I um, save myself so about three and a half hours here yeah i think i saved myself by reserving temporarily reserving some room for myself that's uh yeah we're good all right number um give me a second number 82 critical thinking thanks for sticking with me if you're still watching Find the y-intercept in terms of a, p, and q for the quadratic function f of x equals a times x minus p times x minus q. If they don't ask me to explain it, oh, actually, this will be really easy to do. So I was going to say, like, I already know the answer, but now I have an easier way to do it, and I just revealed it. Um, so here's the original. Here's the thing. The y-intercept is the value of y when x equals 0. So when I substitute 0 for x... I'll get a times 0 minus p times 0 minus q. I was going to do it a different way. But a times negative p times negative q. Now, negative times negative is a positive, so you'll be left with a, p, q. So this is the y-intercept in terms of a, p, q. It's the value of y when x equals 0. They don't say explain, so I just the math should show it. I'm glad a critical thinking problem wasn't long. Ooh, this 83 has three parts. Let's see if I can fit it all as one, sort of. I'll get that ready in a second. Number 83, modeling with mathematics. Is that popcorn? A kernel of popcorn contains water that expands when the kernel's heated, causing it to pop. The equations below represent the popping volume Y in cubic centimeters per gram of popcorn with moisture content X as a percentage of the popcorn's weight. Okay, that's a lot for me to take in. We'll see what I can learn about this. Hot air popping versus hot oil popping. I hope they help me out a little bit here. Popping volume of popcorn with moisture content, X. Oh, X is the moisture content. Hot air versus hot oil. I don't know what that part's about yet. Part A, for hot air popping, what, hold on, I'm going to copy, I don't want to write down these equations, I just want to copy and paste them in case I got to scroll away from that for like reasons. Okay, um, part A. For hot air popping, what moisture content maximizes popping volume? What is the maximum volume? So this is just vertex stuff on this. Um, this is factored form and this is hot air popping. It's popping. It's popping. All right, so for hot air popping, hot air popping, the x-intercepts are 5.52 and 22.6. This is a case where I truly want to average them for axis of symmetry. This is what we need. For the vertex, the axis of symmetry will be averaging 5.52 and 22.6. I could try it in my head. But even still, this is how I do it. I wouldn't use a graph. 5.52 plus 22.6 divided by 2 gives me 14.06. This is the answer to the first part, what moisture content maximizes popping volume. 14.06%. Um, I 
of the popcorn's weight, I think that's how you say it. So we'll answer that in a bit. Now we'll do y equals, well, I'm gonna plug that into the equation. So just pretend like I plugged in 14.06 into all that, okay? So I'm gonna use my calculator for that. That'll be negative 0.761 times 14.06 minus 5.52 times 14.06 minus 2.26, or 22.6. And I'm getting 55.5, this is approximated, but it says 55.5009, etc. So about 55.5 here. So what is the, what moisture content maximizes popping volume? So 14.06% of the popcorn's weight maximizes, I don't know if they had to look this up, moisture volume at 55.5 cubic what? Centimeters per gram? Cubic centimeters per gram. Um, hold on. I'm trying, I'm trying to do that per gram. I'm trying to do um, that. There we go. So there's part A, I believe. Part B, for hot oil popping, what moisture content? All right, so same same questions, right? So I can probably get this template ready and just change things up. I don't know if this makes it harder or easier to do, but it's the same thing that we did on part A. Okay, so hot oil popping, it's popping, it's popping. So X intercepts this time, we have 5.35 and 21.8. 5.35 and 21.8, which is here. I don't know if this makes, this doesn't seem to make it any easier. Just the template at the end. All right, yeah, definitely. 5.35 and 21.8. All right, 5.35, it's gonna be pretty close to the other one plus 21.8 divided by 2 is 13.575. 13.575. Now we're going to substitute that into there. So we have negative 0.652 times 13.575 minus 5.35 times 13.575 minus 21.8. This one is 44.11 about, 44.1, uh, 44.1. Okay, so this is 13.575% and 44.1 cubic centimeters per gram. Part C, use a graphing calculator to graph both functions in the same coordinate plane. What are the domain and range of each function in the situation? Okay, so I started to do all this stuff here uh, on the calculator. Now I gotta actually type them in. I wish I knew to type them in beforehand, so now I gotta redo all this. So let me get this stuff ready. This is how you can follow along. We're gonna get negative 0.761 times x minus 5.52 and x minus and then the other one is negative 0.652 times x takes a while to click all right okay so it says graph them now if i graph them right now i don't know what the problems are going to do there's one there's the other, and I can't see very much. So I gotta increase this window range by quite a bit. Let's go over to, what do I have to get to? Well, 100% I think is a part of what we do, right, for X. So there's that. Y can get up to, it maximizes there. Let's go to 50. Oh, right, 55 is the other one. Okay, so I totally didn't need to go that far. I forgot the percentages go a lot lower. It goes to, okay, 20, and let's in decrease Y's. Let's increase that to about 70 or so. All right, we'll get a little bit more of, Ooh, what did I do here? Hold on, hold on, hold on. What did I do? I don't need this really and why I don't really need any of that. Let's see this a little better. Oh, right. They go beyond. Ugh. 
Sorry. Trying to figure out the right window range. That was her maximum values. Okay. We got to find things there. The problem here is... It says domain and range. The problem here is... Uh, the, the range should be zero, I guess, right? The least you can have is zero popcorn volume, popping popping volume, right? It might not pop at all. So we got to find those intercepts as our domains. The problem is they're going to be so small. So I actually do got to do some zoom-ins on these things here. I got to zoom in way over here because I got to see where they hit separately. And I know now my numbers are in the way. So let me kind of try and zoom in over here and see what I'm hitting. So there's one of them, there's the other one. I gotta find each of these for each function. This is gonna take a little while. So the first one I think was on the right. So I'm going to hit calc, zero, left bound, right bound, I gotta go over this way. I think this is for the first function. I think it's letting me use the first function here. Oh yeah, it is, it shows me right there. So 5.52, oh, the intercepts, what am I doing? What am I doing? It's the intercepts, hello? Mr. Robinson, what are you doing? Stop, 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 stop. Why do we need the graphing calculator? Why do I need the graphing calculator then? We already know this information. We have the intercepts and we have the vertex. Guys, I don't need the graphing calculator for this. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't. Even, that didn't even occur to me. But to go back just for a second, let's, let's see, negative one to 60. To go back, yeah, we're in factored form. We're in intercept form already. So we already have our intercepts from our equations. We have the 5.52 and 22.6, and we have 5.35 and 21.8. And then we have our maximum heights for these things as well. So those would be domain range. See, the we can't have negative popping volume. I don't think we can. I don't think we can have negative popping volume. I think our percent has to go from zero to whatever, so I think it clips our domain at the um, intercepts as well. So I don't know what the graphing calculator has to do with this, guys. I'm going to leave that. I'm going to go straight to, we have factored form. So part C, part C for hot air popping, domain is between your intercepts, I think. So 5.52, that, that's my guess anyway, because you have to be limited by that based off range. And 22.6, remember this is in terms of percent. And then range is in terms of grams per cubic centimeter, or cubic centimeter per gram. This is popping content, which is between zero and 55.5. Excuse me. For hot oil popping, hop, hop on pop, domain goes between 5.35% and 21.8%. You can't really do different percentages to consider, if that makes sense, range, unless you can have negative popping volume. And I'm just going to pretend like you can't. And you go from here to the maximum. So 44.1%. Oh, excuse me, grams, uh, Cent cubic centimeters per gram. Yeah, I definitely needed this extra space on my computer here. All right, let's see how my computer space is doing. Yep, got it, got to push it. But I got one more question. I got one more question, guys. Number 84, final one. A function is written in intercept form with A is greater than zero. What happens to the vertex of the graph as A increases as A approaches zero? A function is written in intercept form with a greater than zero. So yeah, here's the thing, guys. Remember, in vertex form, we have a fixed vertex, right? Doesn't matter if your stretch factor is 10 or 1, your vertex is still at that vertex. But in intercept form, your intercepts are uh, fixed. So what happens here, let's say I have an x-intercept here and an x-intercept here. Now, if I, we'll put it in black first. Now, I can have different graphs. I can have an a that's smaller, which means less of a vertical stretch like that or I can have an A that's bigger. What's gonna happen when the A's bigger versus when the A's smaller? The intercepts are fixed, but the vertex ain't. Here's the vertex on this guy, here's the vertex on this guy. When A gets bigger, the vertex changes. Now it says A is greater than zero, that means it's always upward facing. So with these intercepts, what happens to the vertex of the graph as A increases and as A approaches zero? As A increases, as A increases, the vertex 
gets lower, uh, decreases, right? It goes toward, it, it, it gets sort of neg for bigger negative value as a, and I guess I can just say it that way because we're talking about a positive A value. As A approaches zero, like, you know, as it, the graph flattens out more, the vertex also approaches zero. Uh, also, uh, in increases. When I say decreases, I mean it goes it goes further negative. More more negative, Lar larger negative. I don't know how to say that. The negative increases. As a approaches zero, the vertex increases toward zero on y. I don't know how else to say that correctly, but it's getting closer to zero here. Right, it's getting closer to zero there. Hopefully that kind of makes sense because that's what I'm going with. Hopefully my explanation, hopefully the drawing made sense for you to come up with your better way of saying it than I did. Because guys, I'm a little checked out here. We're at three hours and so and change, three, almost 3.45. So guys, that ought to do it for this one. This is Mr. Robinson. Thank you so much for watching, truly. And thank you for reaching the end if you did. I've got one more section to go in this one. I think it's modeling with quadratic functions. We'll see how that one goes. Significantly less questions. Hopefully significantly less time as well. Thank you so much. Take care. I will see you in the next one.